Getabook.today presents Bloodwing, Book 7 in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet Series, by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2019. Manassas System Conveyance Station, Planet 5 Orbital Track, Stable Asteroid Lunar, 6-1. Alert klaxons screamed in scarlet-tinged corridors. Crew members with official duties ran this way and that, but there was nowhere to hide. The Manassas Conveyance Station orbited a fairly stationary asteroid near the Gitarn frontier, designated as Lunar 6-1. The closest Skywatch facility was in system, more than two billion miles away. Inform those ships this is a civilian facility. They're jamming all the frequencies, Administrator. I... Jarlin Colvert stood before the utilitarian SRS display in MCD ComSat and stared wordlessly at the impossibly dense mass of inbound contacts. None of them registered cleanly. All his relatively simple scanner bank could do was make its best guess as to what it was seeing. It was designed to perform rudimentary space lane traffic control for freighters and supply ships. It was by no means military-grade equipment. The result was a red cloud of tracking data that seeped forward, reaching for the tiny orbital facility with menacing fingers. The automated systems dutifully switched to the perimeter visual pickups when the inbounds broke 100,000 miles. An icy certainty filled the communications center. Even the technician seated at the transmission console rose and slipped the headphones off her ears at the sight filling the screen. They were approaching at impossible speeds, hundreds of fighters with at least a dozen cruiser-class vessels behind them. What do we do? What do we do? Jarlin could hear the young woman's ragged, screaming voice, but his own breathing was paralyzed. The cold inevitability of the sight before him was more than his merely human mind could process. The screen went white. A violent implosion filled the facility with superheated, unstable energy. There was a brief instant of shrieking and boiling flesh. The central section of the conveyance station tumbled out of orbit, trailing hard radiation, atmosphere, and bodies. At least three squadrons of Sarn Bloodwing fighters overflew the destruction, veering in several directions as new targets presented themselves. Two minutes later, the largest remaining intact section came spiraling out of space, and impacted the Lunar 61 asteroid surface at a relative velocity of 18,000 miles per hour. The resulting explosion barely registered against the apocalypse in the sky. Pieces of the station re-achieved escape velocity and scattered into space. Others skipped and bounced for miles. As far as the rest of the sector was concerned, the brutal surprise attack took place without a sound. Humanity's enemies had planned far in advance. The Imperial Battle Formation fielded no fewer than two cruisers equipped specifically for electronic warfare. With the power levels behind the counter-transmission waves being directed at the Alliance facility, there was no way to broadcast anything beyond a range of a few miles. Even the disaster buoys launched from the station were torn out of space the moment they broke free of their launch boosters. Fighters set upon cargo shuttles like a starving pack of wild dogs. Anti-ship missiles impacted the lumbering boxy spacecraft, setting off violent explosions that filled space with strobing afterimages. Wave after wave of disruptor fire tore through station modules like tracer fire through layers of paper napkins. The local comnet was jammed with overlapping barked orders, screams, and crackling static. Finally, the main antenna vanished as four simultaneous concussion explosions engulfed it. The comm traffic suddenly cut off, like a windpipe being closed for good. The first scale in command of the task force grinned wickedly as his enormous fighter formation savaged the defenseless station. Secondaries popped off in drifting hull structures as missile impacts flashed and burned along the remaining sections of the orbital depot. A police pinnace ran for the far side of the 2,000-mile-wide asteroid. The four fighters pursuing it didn't have to fire a shot. The security pilot swerved too close to the asteroid's surface. Gravimetric feedback began to overload his drive field. He tried to make a break for open space, but it was far too late for such a small ship. Lightning briefly arced between surface and ship until it vanished in a white flash. The outpost's ground facilities were better defended than the orbiting station. They had rudimentary radiation and magnetic shielding due to their more advanced power systems. They survived the first bombardment. They almost survived the second. White-hot lances of disruptor energy rained down across the surface like the wrath of Zeus. Chunks of superheated rock tumbled into space, trailing white and blue plasma. A storm of static electric energy formed over the target as the Sarn weapons ionized everything in a radius of a thousand miles. Then a series of nuclear detonations pounded the outpost. Tectonic ruptures formed in all directions. The other Imperial cruisers joined in. 
Over the course of some 20 minutes of unrelenting space-to-surface bombardment, the ground emplacement was burned into a 600-foot-deep magma-filled crater, along with 147 civilian personnel, a frigate-class starship hull, two fusion reactors, and a disaster boy launcher. There were 11 human witnesses to the horror that followed. A spherical shape loomed in space over the remains of the ground station. There was no strategic purpose for its presence. There was no enemy for it to engage. It was being utilized to send humanity a message. The Kraken World Burner activated its primary weapon. It ignited space again and again. Fusion explosions shattered half-mile-deep slabs of solid iron under the asteroid's surface, turning them into clouds of radioactive fire. Thirteen minutes later, there was nothing left of Lunar 6-1 except a trail of wreckage and unremarkable ores. As the raider formation set course for its next objective, the first scale ordered his ships to jettison thousands of tons of uranium and thorium waste over the attack site. A plasma burst from one of his ship's weapons ignited the cloud of specially prepared energetic particles, creating a field of radioactive fire. It was a navigational hazard that would take weeks to extinguish and decontaminate. What was left behind would be unrecognizable as the work of an intelligent species. It was the space equivalent of salting the earth and contaminating the water supply with dead bodies and disease. The last distress buoy was pulverized by a Sarn fighter 70,000 miles from the burning cloud. It would be more than a month before the true nature of what had happened to the Lunar 6-1 facility was determined. Skywatch Reflector Deus Undersea Base, Rho Theta 5 Northern Latitudes, Captain Odessa Lin Commanding. The volcanic activity along the floor of the Damocles Ocean on Rho Theta 5 was both scientifically valuable and life-sustaining. Without it, liquid water would not exist anywhere on the planet, which would make a facility like Reflector Base impossible to build. As it was, the mighty facility was one of the Alliance's greatest achievements. It was situated a full three miles below the ocean's surface, protected from the stormy and poisonous surface conditions by more than 9,000 feet of dense ice. One of the key characteristics of the Damocles Ocean and other concentrations of liquid water on Rho Theta 5 was that up to a third of its volume consisted of heavy water, which replaced hydrogen in the standard H2O molecule with deuterium. The resulting physical properties of the ice and currents were unusual, to say the least. The good news was the base could make use of heavy water for a variety of scientific endeavors. There were several competing theories on how such quantities could exist absent some form of artificial production, but those discussions were largely relegated to the halls of academia. For the Skywatch personnel on the base, the presence or absence of one or more bonus atoms in each molecule of water wasn't a top priority. What was a top priority was the unusual communications traffic being picked up by the base's orbiting relay. Captain Odessa Lin was one of the few alarmist officers who escaped the aftermath of the years-long schism at headquarters. Because of her unique knowledge and training command, she was classified as indispensable by Joint Supreme Command, and therefore untouchable. That didn't stop the anti-alarmists from targeting her base and its supply lines for all manner of nonsense, including interfering in the routine maintenance of the station's geothermal energy systems. There were specialized automated systems installed in the catacombs, as they were called, to plumb the depths of the vertical tunnels that had been drilled into the seafloor. This was a necessary operation that had to be performed rather meticulously. Although the walls of the catacombs were made of mazarite and assembled in the same honeycomb-like lattice as a starship's armor, it was still necessary to perform advanced analysis on them to detect any irregularities before they became weaknesses. Given the temperatures and the unusual pressures involved, a tiny crack could lead to a catastrophic failure in a matter of seconds. This was Reflector Base's top priority. That didn't stop various officers and their staffs at headquarters from requesting more information after each request for engineering teams to be assigned. It was one of those requests that Captain Lin thought was being addressed when the flash message came in. I'd stake pretty much anything on the origin being local, ma'am, the Reflector Signals technician said. There isn't enough power in this transmission for it to be a Missouri relay or for it to be coming from the Proximans. Lin studied the signal analysis on the main screen on the station's upper-level coordination deck. And we didn't get any of the message itself? she asked. Only the headers, ma'am. We know it was an all-stations broadcast, which means there's a very good chance it was also some kind of alert status upgrade. But the message itself was corrupted somehow. The captain smiled and shook her head. If I know Buford Tucker, he's probably chewing someone's door off its hinges right about now. What about the Proximans? 
The CUDA reported arrival on station two days ago. She has escorts, and I'm betting at least one of them is a communications platform coordinating with the perimeter base. But the headers in this message looked like Skywatch. Captain Lin reached over and called up the most recent readiness report for the Rho Theta system. The Kuta and her battle group had been slotted into Rho Theta 4's command as a primary planetary defense formation designated Task Force 67. The Proximan Crown had made it clear his kingdom was not equivocal about its opposition to Sarn aggression. While His Majesty was frequently non committal, especially in light of Proxima's relative dearth of military might compared to the rest of the Core Alliance, on this occasion there was no question as to the felonoid race's intentions. True, they were sword wielders and they revered their quasi-medieval culture of chivalry and honor. But when it came to war, humanity could find no ally more loyal anywhere in known space. The problem was Proximan captains, especially those leading dreadnought-anchored battle groups, were highly unlikely to broadcast anything short of total disaster. They more often deferred to the closest Alliance capital ship, which in this case was none other than the Constitution, under the command of Admiral Buford Tucker. At the same time, HMAV Kuta controlled the spacehead for decor, which had the point on the surface of Rho Theta 4. The entire sector's communications array was on the RT-4 surface, which was the justification for landing the equivalent of six mechanized divisions to establish a base of operations for system-wide defense and amphibious operations into Mycenae Seti. The more she thought about it, the more the captain's attention focused on the RT-4 array. Was it possible Decor was engaged in some kind of unusual transmission activity? SATCOM operations were authorized in all commands, and that meant there was at least a possibility the signal reflector base had received was encrypted somehow. But if the headers didn't indicate it was a SATCOM relay, then even the signal's text wouldn't be able to crack it. Only commanding officers and CSOs had the necessary keys. Comms, have that message delivered to my quarters. Ma'am? The one with the corrupted data and the intact headers. The technician's confused look only lasted a moment. He suddenly realized the captain's request wasn't small talk. Aye. Lin strode into the main traversal load lane on Reflector's upper deck. Overhead, approximately six stories above the floor, was the enormous dome transparency surface of the station's highest main module. The upper section was closest to the surface, and also the smallest of the eight major structures that made up the base. All were built to withstand unimaginable stress and pressure and all were designed with tolerances comparable to specialized space frames for heavy construction equipment. Balancing weight, mass, stress points, and materials, science were among the most important skills for what had come to be known as a hostile environments architect. Since much of ancient Earth's training for what were known at the time as astronauts took place in the only readily available environment they had on the surface, the relationship between underwater and orbital construction disciplines was not only formed early, but had a massive head start over all the other sciences that followed. The relationship between building a vehicle or habitat sturdy enough to survive under the ocean and building one to survive voyages in space was so well understood by the time of the first interstellar flight that it was up to human explorations leaders to try and find a planet with survivable oceans just so all of man's advanced knowledge could be put to use. Rho Theta IV was discovered many centuries after those missions. But even by then, the objectives had not been lost. It was not far from Reflector Base, for example, that the groundbreaking experiments demonstrating the unusual pressure effects of Cantlin type drive fields on captured atmospheric elements were conducted. One of the advancements that resulted from those experiments was incorporated in the life support and emergency evacuation facilities of Reflector Base itself. The captain was one of only a few officers in Skywatch aware of these facts and their origins just like she was probably one of only a handful of people in her current command, who would have thought of encrypted communications traffic being hidden in plain sight, so to speak. Lynn was a dark-haired woman of average height. Were it not for her occasionally startling rank insignia, she was not a person likely to attract attention. She was attractive, but not striking. She was in fairly good shape given the fact she rarely got a chance to venture outdoors, and given her occupation, required her to be several miles underwater at all hours. Most of the station personnel who didn't work with her directly rarely noticed her at all unless she spoke to them. She strode past the observation bay for Vessel Deck 5 and passed at least three dozen people, none of whom even looked up. It was to be expected. Odessa Lynn had been the unexpected achiever all her life. 
She navigated the rabbit warren of offices at the end of the access corridor and finally reached her quarters on the upper module's weather deck, named for the fact it was the only set of cabins that could see up into the lightless night blue Rho Theta Ocean. Her console was quietly glowing, indicating the waiting message. Computer, this is Captain Odessa Lin. Identifier Minotaur 7011. Match voice print, identify and grant security access. Acknowledged, Captain Odessa Lin. Voice print matches. Security access upgrade request granted. How can Reflector Base help you today? Perform cryptographic analysis on waiting message time stamped within the last 10 T minutes. There was a pause as the base computer ran the message through several specialized filters designed to look for telltale structures, header information, or other packaging that would indicate some kind of piggybacked transmission. Analysis complete. Message is part one of a 14-part message keyed to your identifier. The most recent upgrade to the Missouri cipher was utilized to encrypt the message contents. Shall I retrieve the remaining 13 parts and decode the message in its entirety? Lynn took the seat at her desk. Affirmative. She stared intently at the screen. The face of Marine Captain Liam Henkel appeared. Lynn felt her heart skip at least one beat. She was looking at the face of a man that had been officially missing for some time. She was also looking at the face of the man she had been engaged to for nearly ten months. Desi, I need you to listen to me very carefully. We slipped into the Bloodwing base in Mount Tinavu and found something. Something big. Embedded in this message is a holographic star map centered on the Rho Theta system. A Sarn fleet action with the objective of destroying RT-4's communications array and the Missouri Jump Gate is set to commence at any moment. They've rigged the Proximan listening post at System's Edge with explosives, and they are going to hit the Descartes Jump Gate with everything they have. They already launched a strike force into Manassas for a surprise attack. We tried to get the word out, but there wasn't enough time. There's no telling what they encountered out there. Odessa covered her mouth with her hand. Dozens of enemy ship formations appeared on the star map as Henkel's voice continued. They're on to Jason Hunter's ruse. Whatever he is trying to do on Epsilon Gamma is leading him and everyone else he has working with him into a trap. The Sarn's little secret on that planet turned out to be not quite as little as we thought. Admiral Tucker's battle group is going to be blown out of space if you don't reinforce. If they defeat Task Force 9, they'll move on Proxima next. You have to hurry, Desi. The only thing keeping the Sarn out of Rho Theta right now is the final prep on M78. You have days, perhaps hours. Henkel's face reappeared. Don't ask me how I know all this. Suffice to say we discovered a mad scientist in the wreckage. When all of this is over, we may not make it. We're two light years behind enemy lines. But you have to survive. Reflector Base has to survive. Defend Rho Theta at all costs. If you fail, it's the end of the human race. By now, tears were streaming down Captain Lin's face. I may not be able to get another message to you. I love you, Desi. No matter what happens, you'll always be in my heart. An instant later, all the deck lights shifted red. Somewhere the captain heard the general quarter's alarm, but all she could think of was the pain in Liam's eyes as his face faded from view. General Cornelius Hunter's bunker complex. Epsilon Gamma 3, 0.7 miles below Sagrella Village. This is a Skywatch capsule fusion reactor! Cerulea Lorleon's voice echoed off the concrete walls. The metal-reinforced tunnel ran for at least a thousand yards in each direction. The overhead lights had to be pulling at least ten kilowatts by themselves. It was like being in an aircraft hangar, if said hangar had been built more than a half mile underground. What can I say? My gramps plans ahead. Jason Hunter didn't look the least bit surprised. He was one of the few people who knew what his grandfather had been up to for years. He was back in his trademark denim jeans, this time with a Skywatch Fleet t-shirt and white athletic shoes. Cerulea had been offered a Fleet t-shirt. The look on her face gave Jason chills so he decided against any further offers of Alliance military accessories. The captain of the Condor Pirates had only heard rumors about the retired general's bunker complex, mostly from Jason. She knew the hunter patriarch was more than a little off, but nothing prepared her for this. The ceilings in the main loadway were seven stories overhead. The lights were all luminous gas bulb models that hadn't been used seriously for more than 200 years. Cerulea and Jason, had already visited the munition storage, where the Pirate Queen had personally witnessed the supply of spare bulbs. 
The crates were stacked 10 feet high alongside the general's personal collection of man-portable anti-tank weapons and his still-operational Erlikon shoulder-mount rocket launcher manufactured so far in the past, Lorleon would have had to break out a handheld to do the math. It was the automated demolition and construction equipment that sent her over the edge. Hold it! Hold it! Jason turned, hands in pockets. You had this all planned out! Hunter raised an eyebrow. Far as you know, Cerulea stepped towards the captain with a vaguely menacing expression on her face. Now look, I'm not your secretary, Mr. Hunter. If you've got a plan and you want my help, you had better let me in on it, or you're going to find yourself riding a horse-drawn wagon back to Sagrella. You wouldn't leave me stranded. Wanna bet? Gambling is illegal on this planet. You wouldn't be trying to corrupt a Skywatch line officer now, would you? Hunter gave his opposite number an unearned grin. I've already corrupted you, funny man. Now out with it. What the hell are you doing? And what are you cooking up with that gun-waving maniac you're related to? The pirate folded her arms and shifted her weight to favor one hip. Her expression told the captain he wasn't going to be able to smart-aleck his way out of this one. Smokey and I made a deal when I first got word there were... individuals at Skywatch with my officers in their crosshairs. I was under threat of assassination. At least that's the back-channel message I got from Admiral Power's Chief of Staff. They were also apparently trying to set me up for the murder of Vice Admiral Charles Hughes. So that's what brought you all the way out to Magellan looking for informants? That's why you ordered your senior officers to arm themselves? Exactly. This plan has been in operation for months. I involved you only to a certain necessary extent. I wanted things arranged so you could slip out the back door if everything went sideways. The look on Hunter's face was so matter-of-fact it gave Cerulea pause. It had been a long time since she had seen him this serious. It wasn't until Honora discovered Hughes was still alive that it blew everything wide open. It was then we knew we had more than one enemy, and they weren't just Sarn. Why didn't you tell me? She asked in a small voice. The kind of voice she would never use around anyone but Jason Hunter. You've got enough to worry about. Jason. Cerulea's eyes locked with his. Why didn't you tell me? Hunter hesitated. The struggle was visible on his face. I was trying to protect you. You don't need to protect me, Captain, Cerulea snapped. I'm not one of your Academy conquests. We've been through more than that together. And we've been over this subject before. Yes, yes, you can take care of yourself. But that's not good enough. I'm a belt and suspenders kind of guy when it comes to this kind of thing. You've always trusted me. Even when I had no reason to. Jason gave Cerulea a skeptical look. A woman does not rise to lead the Condor pirates unless she has some fortitude. But grit isn't going to matter when we're up against these people. They are treacherous, Leah. They won't stop until they get what they want. Why not just dress me in a gown and put me in a tower? Then I can seductively brush my hair while I wait to get kidnapped. Because occasionally, I need fire support, Jason quipped. Very funny. Hunter's expression didn't change. Is that really what you think of me? Just a hired gun? I think you're a dangerous pirate who has even less information about her enemies than I do. I can't snare you in this and then just leave you to deal with it. You thought you were going to die, and that I was going to be next. Jason nodded. Something like that. Cerulea drew close. She let her hands rest on the young captain's chest. I'm not going to let you die, Jason. I can apply pressure, too. Sending in the leg breakers isn't going to feed the bulldog this time, Captain. These guys are active on multiple fronts. They are flag officers with multi-billion dollar budgets. They have incredible intelligence resources. They are working with our enemies, and they know they're facing capital charges if they are exposed. It's life and death for them, and it's no different for us. All of humanity is at stake here. Well, I'm more concerned with one human in particular. Hunter smirked. Why so protective? Lorleon smirked back. Because you owe me a hell of a lot of money, Captain. Jason slid his arms around Cerulea's slender waist. I don't plan on checking out just yet. I've been keeping Smokey in the loop, and he's been telling stories about Sarn activity on this planet. Something the fine members of the Hansen family just confirmed for us all. Admiral Powers made up a story about my need to recover from the defeat at El Rey so I could disappear from the front lines for a while. We have a manhunt underway, and Cochrane is keeping Argent in on it as well. 
Now that we're at war, time isn't on our side. Okay, Jason? This is the same man who roared off at 3 a.m. one morning because he claimed there were interdimensional aliens genetically altering the soy crop with invisible laser weapons. You do remember that night, do you not? It was ten below out there. You ended up stranded offshore with a burned-out radio and a couple of flare-rounds. If it weren't for Jace's quick thinking and my forcible appropriation of rescue equipment from a rather uncooperative police ship, you would still be out there living in a grass hut and eating coconuts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I hate coconuts. Exactly. So you better learn to show some gratitude. Who are we looking for now? Atwell again? I wish it were that simple. This new guy was seen right here on Epsilon Gamma 3 less than a month ago. We don't have his name. We're not even entirely sure he's human. What we do know is that he managed to breach security at Lethe Deeps. Then he showed up on Raleo 2. He escaped from the obelisk complex with some kind of artifact none of us can even hazard a guess about. Jace tracked him to the planet's surface. She hasn't checked in, so we don't know what his status is. If I haven't heard from her in the next 30 hours, I'm aborting our play dead act and going after the Psy Key. How did he know about Bioni? That's the whole problem. Nobody knew about what's under Lethe Deeps, except myself, Jace, Komanov, and our senior officers. There are details about what we found down there I didn't even include in my reports. Yet somehow this guy zeroes in on the place like he's been sitting in the room the whole time. What's the mission? There may be heavy Sarn activity on this planet. You and I both know that's unusual. That combined with the presence of this denominator, as Jace calls him, leads me to believe we need to do some serious investigating, and that means we need General Hunter's help. Jason, the man is certifiable. You remember the last time you had to coax him out of that bus station? It was the first and only time the psychiatrist left the hospital in a straitjacket. He was getting married. To a cocktail waitress who wasn't even old enough to enter a bar, much less work in one. She had no idea what the hell was going on. Come on, Captain, you were there. How many more times are we going to have to bring him back home after helping his latest blushing bride pack up her feathers and heels? He's lonely, Leah. Graham's passed more than five years ago. He doesn't have anyone to talk to except those dingbat drinking buddies. He was married for almost 50 years. It's tough for someone to be alone after all that time. Only thing that keeps him going is that he thinks he's helping me save the universe. If that means I have to occasionally say hello to some 20-year-old chick who he's talked into a tour of his underground empire, so be it. Every one of those girls pulls me aside to tell me she's in awe of what she's seen, and not a single one of them has any idea what to make of General Cornelius Hunter. Skywatch Marine Corps retired. I'll say this much. More than one of them ended up loving the man to death. At least he isn't out starting fistfights with the cops or sitting in a recliner crying drunk five nights a week. Cerulea sighed. All right, you've convinced me. What's your plan? First, I need to make sure he isn't the target. Then I need to make sure this complex is secure. Then I need to find out what the Empire is protecting here. Because the very last thing we need in a war where we are already outgunned is for our enemy to show up with a secret weapon at the wrong time. I can't imagine what the hell they are doing all the way out here in the first place. And that's making me more nervous than whatever they might be concealing. How is a reactor going to help? This is only the first level. Cerulea blanched. You hunters are all certifiable. Hey, I never claimed to be sane. By the way, if you think old Smokey is twisted, you should see what grams had stashed under the oven for the last twenty years. A door slammed. Boots rang against metal stairs. A few moments later, none other than retired General Cornelius Hunter appeared at the load bay entrance. If you two are through slow dancing, I've got your little machines hooked up in the lab. The general looked like Santa Claus had joined the Marines. His gray beard was trimmed to surface warfare tolerances. He was wearing full camo complete with a heavy sidearm and a pair of all-terrain boots. He had his own hardwood engraved universal in one hand and a magnesium beam torch in the other. One clear fact about Jason Hunter's grandfather was that he was always armed and equipped for medium-weight equipment repair and open theater combined arm skirmishes. Cerulea was fairly certain he wore a charged blaster in a holster to bed every night with extra power packs stashed in the nightstand. The two young captains followed the hunter patriarch down a well-lit side corridor towards a pair of double doors. Inside was one of the former Marine's electronics labs. This one was tended by a not-quite-regulation trundle bot, with rather distinctive modifications Jason instantly recognized as having been manufactured by his darling sister. 
The bot was equipped with a Talon gas plasma cutter and a set of searchlights, some of which appeared to be tuned to non-visible light frequencies. On the main lab table stood a miniaturized version of the transport system Commander Curtis had designed aboard Argent. Next to one of the platforms was a portable terminal running a simulation of the conversion drive Commanders Curtis and Tixia had improvised in the Omicron sector. Did you get a chance to review Yili's data? Cornelius tossed his universal on a cluttered metal shelf and picked up a rag. I ran the numbers. The theory checks out. If all the data in that simulation is accurate, your engineer may have advanced our understanding of spaceflight by a century or more. Cornelius washed his hands with a bar of anti-grease soap. I'm not saying I approve of college girls serving aboard a ship of the line, of course. Damnedest thing I ever heard of. Ought to be putting napkins under teacups. Cerulea took a breath. Jason gestured urgently for her to relax. She glared at the captain and spoke through clenched teeth. This is the little surprise you were talking about? Cerulea asked as she watched the simulation carefully. Sea drive, also known as conversion drive, Hunter replied. We can cruise at 40 times light speed by modifying a standard Cantlin-type field. We can get bursts of up to 2,000 times light speed. We used it to escape from the supermassive singularity near the Atlantis sector. This is real? You actually use this? Cerulea asked, looking at Jason intently. Aboard Argent? It's the other half of my disappearing act, Jason replied. Powers wants this kept absolutely confidential until we're ready to spring it on the Sarn along with our little transport gizmo. The only thing standing in our way at the moment is making it production ready. Is your faction of crazies at headquarters after this thing? Cornelius asked. Don't trust a word. I've warned you about those people before. If James and the anti-alarmists knew about it, they would strangle it and bury it somewhere way out in the desert, Jason replied. We needed time to get the sea drive tech to a select group of our own captains first. Which captains? Cerulea asked. You, for one, Jason replied. Yili cooked up a new module for the Shrike. It's in your cargo hold. How the hell did you get a new drive module into my cargo hold? Cerulea roared. I have all the specs to your ship, Jason replied without looking up. Now I have all the specs to your improved ship. The look on the Pirate Queen's face inspired Jason to be concerned for his own safety, so the captain tried to keep an all-business look on his face despite the raised eyebrows. We're on the clock! Cerulea bared her teeth. One of these days, Captain, I'm gonna... Pretty smart of your engineer to imagine that if a combination wormhole and drive field could get your ship from place to place in a hurry, it would work on equipment and personnel too, the general added. Sure she doesn't have a secret helper somewhere? She's the real deal, Pops, Hunter replied, examining some of the general's new tools. If you say so, the power requirements all check out. We could move half a ton of liquid, solid or gas anywhere in a couple hundred miles and run the whole thing off my own power systems right here. Jason began hooking the complex's power grid into the devices. Everyone's been so busy imagining that teleportation required matter to be destroyed and recreated that they never considered just moving it more efficiently was the right answer. The captain took a seat on one of the metal stools and put the control module through a diagnostic cycle. He picked up an Atmos scanner and performed a quick analysis of the data. Now for the important question, the Elder Hunter began. What in plaid-colored hell did you bring back to my once peaceful planet? I think that's a fine question myself, Cerulea added, folding her arms. She was still a little annoyed that unauthorized personnel had been aboard her ship without her knowledge. Although she had to admit she was extremely interested in seeing Yili's sea drive in action. Apparently we brought two things to Epsilon Gamma, Jason replied, tinkering with the control board for the miniature transport mechanism. The captain's Atmos handheld was now sitting on one of the pads. One of them is called the Denominator. He may have acquired this technology on Bione 3. Skywatch Intelligence has been looking for this guy for a while. We're not sure if he's in cahoots with Atwell or his organization or not, but he was positively identified by Jace aboard the Psy Key on the surface of Raleo 2. What's the other thing? Cerulea asked. Cornelius dried his hands with the dirty rag. There's Sarn activity on this planet. Nobody cares about Epsilon Gamma 3, or at least nobody cared about it until a few weeks ago. Officially, I'm recuperating from the El Rey engagement. Unofficially, my mission is to track down whatever shenanigans are going on here. Skywatch believes the Sarn might be working with this denominator character, and if that is true, 
We need to know what they are cooking up before they spring it on us in combat. Powers sent you down here alone to draw out the Sarn? Cornelius asked with raised eyebrows. Good to see some things never change with those chowder heads. Ordinarily, calling a four-star flag officer a chowder head would be considered rude. Then again, Cornelius Hunter's flag had a few stars emblazoned on it too, so he was allowed. Jason and Cerulea had already been through the general study. One entire wall of the room was devoted to flags, banners, unit standards, and awards from alien governments and military dignitaries. Argent's pretending to be grounded, Jason replied. In reality, she's fully crewed and playing dead at Gale River. I'm on a short clock here. My first priority was to run down any civilian involvement, and I've confirmed Skywatch Intelligence's suspicions so far. Now I just have to find out what they are hiding here, and I've got a lead. Jason glanced at Cerulea, who rolled her eyes. You've also got a spacecraft out there with illegal weapons mounted on it. You know M-guns were outlawed by Treaty Boy, the general said sarcastically. They aren't my M-guns, Jason replied with a grin. A likely story, Cerulea teased. Now we know where you and your sister got your unique personalities. They didn't get them from me, Cornelius muttered, banging around in one of his 68 toolboxes. I always said they were adopted, but nobody listened to me, so I just stuck to my mashed potatoes. As far as I'm concerned, the two of them ought to be teaching classes for the slow kids at an elementary school. Every Christmas bunch of scatterbrained little hooligans running up and down the stairs like they were in some kind of fire station. Jace with her tinker metal contraptions and the boy with those smoke-clouded model rockets. Why I oughta... While the general ranted, Jason reconfigured the mechanism and looked over at Cerulea. The commit button illuminated and all the indicators shifted green. I'm sure as hell going to utilize every advantage we've got if push comes to shove. In fact, my ship and crew are on a 12-hour ready alert, and there isn't a soul alive anywhere on this planet who suspects a Citadel-class strike battleship can transit from Core 3 to Epsilon Gamma in a half day. If I do find what I'm looking for down here, I'm going to unleash a big old kennel full of ass-biting dogs, and God help whoever they catch first. Jason activated the miniature transport device and teleported his Atmos handheld nine feet across the table to the opposite pad. Cerulea gave him a sarcastic look and slow-clapped. Raleo Inversion. Landing Party 2. Lieutenant Devin Leach commanding. The sky looked ominous. As ironic as that was, Lieutenant Devin Leach was in no mood for puns. Every puddle he trudged through threatened to soak through his boots. Of all the people in the detail, it was Leach who knew better than most the dangers of wet socks. Not only were they a morale drain, in this kind of climate they were more likely than not to create a variety of annoying medical hazards. Normally, the lieutenant and his team would be wearing gear appropriate for the climate, but this situation was about as far from normal as any officer could imagine. Even in the best of circumstances, they were going to have to keep every piece of technology they had hidden. According to their maps, the village was only a quarter mile away. It seemed strange they could see no cattle or people in any direction, even on the road. One would think that someone would at least be hauling wares to or from the settlement, or simply getting water but there wasn't a soul to be found. A breeze caught the tall grass and caused the posts of the nearby fence to creak. Contacts? Negative, sir. The lieutenant's second was a promising young able crewman first class on his first surface mission. Higher-ranking fleet enlisted were in short supply given the sudden need for specialists of all stripes, so it fell to the up-and-coming crew members to take up the slack. The lieutenant's four-person squad was as green as a spring pond, but like all officers, Leach was a believer in the old adage of combat experience. Nothing grows until it's buried in fertilizer. Leach wasn't a big fan of leading men in a line up an unfamiliar road. Fleet or not, all Skywatch officers were trained for surface warfare. All officer candidates were regaled at one point or another by stories of the Redcoats marching into combat in formation, dozens abreast. It was surely proper and disciplined and an altogether British way of waging war, but the English, and as it turned out the Japanese, French, Germans, Chinese, and Spanish as well, were disabused of its effectiveness by the advent of the machine gun and trench warfare a century later. None could fail to recognize the excellence of Her Majesty's navies and their dominance of a world seas for nearly two centuries. Her armies, on the other hand, didn't fare as well. Lieutenant Leach, still more centuries removed from musket and formation, performed the same calculus as the officers of the ancient crown when evaluating risks. 
He didn't like leading men in a line up a road with wide open fields of fire in every direction in a potentially dangerous place. Granted, ACFC Thule was a capable SRS tech, and his equipment was in fine working order. It still didn't change the lieutenant's attitude. Somewhere a few hundred miles overhead, the starship underscore Psy Key underscore was on station, coordinating more than a few heavily disguised landing parties at various points across central England. The lieutenant was quite sure a Skywatch command was going to be very interested to hear Jace Hunter's explanation for his ship's current position. But up to now, the Admiralty hadn't demonstrated much of a grasp of what Hunter's crew had been up against. It was pretty unlikely they were going to understand why the captain had ordered his ship to pursue one man into humanity's ancient past. What both the lieutenant and the commander did know was that if Psy Ki failed in her current mission, the outcome of the Second Praetorian War was likely to be rather unfavorable, and that was the optimistic analysis. In fact, if Hunter didn't catch the maniac she had chased across 500 years of history, Whatever remained of the human race would be unlikely to survive at all. If they did, the next thousand years were going to make the Dark Ages look like a Saturday evening post cover. Feels like we've walked into a history book, sir, Thule offered. Leech sighed. I suppose that's one way to look at it. I hope we can find what we're looking for and get out of here quick. What are we looking for, sir? Like Commander Tixia says, we'll know it when we see it. I just hope these people don't mistake us for shamans or something and burn us at the stake. Are they that superstitious, sir? Thule didn't sound like he wanted to hear the answer. If there's any sanity in the parish, it will be domiciled at St. Andrews. At least that's what the library computer thinks. Three quarters of a click bearing 206. I've got intermittent life signs, sir, but nothing I can lock in, Thule said. He looked frustrated, as if his tools weren't quite showing the readings he expected. Lieutenant, one of the squad riflemen indicated a sign along the edge of the road. It read, Ombersley Population 308. Although they were called riflemen by regulation, on this mission, the heaviest weapon they had was a TK-12. Concussion rifles were tougher to hide, and the last thing Leech needed was a disruptor wave taking out half of someone's barn. The sound of a crow's call floated over the road. Well, at least the birds are home, Leech said. Remember your cover names and make sure all your rank insignia is hidden or removed. Weapons at 20% power. Watch your targets. Everyone here is a civilian. Except one, Thule added. Except one. Leech led the squad towards the nearest of the shadowy structures standing against the late day light. Wolfpack Formation Lycan Spear. X-Ray Tango Interdiction Zone. Commander Torlin Zweiger. Commanding Report Status. Formation cloaked and operating on a 6x6 electronics envelope, on course to intercept unidentified hostile formation target Kilowatt November 2, bearing 040 Mark 5. Very well. Signals, what's our alert status? All decks report alert condition 1, standing by battle station's energy. Excellent. The squadron is cleared to vector to waypoint 5. Time out 2 minutes. Acknowledged. Coding your message. Commander Zweiger was as eccentric looking as his fellow attack destroyer captains. Due to his disability, he wore extraordinarily effective light barriers in the form of wraparound black eyeglasses. On anyone else, the spectacles may as well have been a blindfold. But for Torilon Zweiger, they were indispensable. If he were to remove them, it would become clear at once why they were necessary. The commander was born with a rare abnormality that made him unusually sensitive to light. With his specially constructed, smart glasses, he could function as well as any other Skywatch officer. The reason he was in command of DSS Vermont, however, is because Commander Zweiger functioned much better than most Skywatch officers to begin with. Zweiger was a Wolfpack commander, one of the few starship captains with specialized training in how to deploy the newest Delaware-class attack destroyers. His squadron consisted of four vessels including the Delaware herself, along with DSS Rhode Island and DSS New Hampshire. Delaware and her sister ships were designed to hunt down and kill stealthed enemy vessels. They were nicknamed Ghost Killers and it was a moniker they had all earned. The achievements of Lieutenant Commander Darrell Walsh and his assassin's weapon were pointed to again and again when the role and value of the advanced attack destroyers were questioned. Twice already, the Rhode Island had been responsible for saving her fleetmates by being where no enemy expected her. Now Walsh had brought his expertise to Zweiger's command, turning one feared ship into a formation of dark riders in the cold eternal night of space. It was Walsh who had coined the motto of his class of ships right from the pages of the Book of Proverbs. 
the wicked flee when none pursueth. The truth was, Zweiger's formation wasn't the only predator in the jungle this night. The formation that had brutally murdered the Manassas conveyance station was on course for the Shasta jump gate. It was clear from their direction and choice of targets what the Sarn objective was. Disabling Shasta would cut off both Manassas and El Rey from the rest of core space. They were also escorting a world burner, which made capture of the formation an overwhelming priority. At the same time, all four Wolfpack captains were confused by the fact two of the formation's ships had peeled off and were moving towards the inner planets of the Manassas system at high speed. This presented the destroyer squadron with a dilemma. Sir, I have the Vermont on loss. On screen. The troubled expression on the face of the Vermont's captain told Zweiger his group wasn't likely to be enthusiastic about splitting up. I think I know what you're going to say, Connie. You know the old Russian proverb, don't you, Commander? Remind me. A man who chases two rabbits catches none. Zweiger chuckled. I think it's pretty clear at this point what the breakaway ships are after. The station is undefended. Eastern Banner pulled the pickets out of the system after the Prairie Grove incident. I can't imagine the justification for leaving an entire star system defenseless, Zweiger said. Even if the station has ground-based defenses, they're still taking a huge risk with a major strategic position. Their fighters are scheduled to arrive tomorrow. Zweiger and most of his bridge crew looked up in unison. Say again? There are two detachments of Wildcat fighters set to arrive at Manassas tomorrow. That was the extent of Eastern Banner's respect for the confirmed presence of five Bloodwing squadrons at El Rey. Commander, why are the Sarn always a day early? While we're at it, why does the flag of a formation defending a star system almost 20 light years from here have to also take responsibility for defending a station that is one hop off a system we just lost along with five starships? We've got to make a decision, Torlin. Those two vessels are an hour out. It's the station or the jump gate. Zweiger studied the tactical display as carefully as he dared. He knew if he got into the never-ending cycle of what-ifs, he'd never make a decision. What are the chances they're taking that world burner through the gate and into core space? Pretty remote. There's a fixed perimeter five light years out from core prime. There are two heavies assigned to the repeater network. Without force projection, they'll be cut to ribbons before they get anywhere they can use a space-to-surface weapon. All right. I'm going to rely on your experience with this region of space, Connie. Signal the squadron to set an intercept course for the two Unidents now entering Manassas space. Formation alert condition one. Standby battle stations. All ahead emergency flank. The four destroyers howled across the system perimeter like witches riding storm clouds. The hunt was on. Rho Theta 3 forward operating base. Deck 3 operations. Commander Gerald Foyt commanding. The captain of one of Buford Tucker's key heavy escorts strode along the main deck of the RT-3 orbital base with the bearing of an officer who had long since had enough. For more than a week, every order issued from her ship to the personnel aboard the station had gotten some form of blowback. When Cavalier 10 was temporarily reassigned to the station's star wing, contention, missed appointments, when the station's fuel systems were scheduled for emergency upgrade, delays, Arguments, missing officers, claims the work was unauthorized. It was like trying to perform intricate surgery with a homeowner's association board debating each suture. With the captain were two other officers. One was Commander Gil Rogers, Vice's science specialist. He wasn't strictly needed for his expertise in physics or chemistry on this occasion. He was there because of his rank, and the fact he was rather tall compared to his CO. With her also was acting Commander Sabrina Mallory who represented the Admiral's other heavy escort. For better or worse, she was also the former acting first officer and later acting commanding officer of a capital ship, namely DSS Argent. Skywatch personnel who were in charge of five million ton warships, even temporarily, often looked just a bit more intimidating in the reflected glow. With Mallory were two armed military police officers from Fury's Mobile Security Command, the various station crew members who saw the determined formation stopped for a moment to watch. Some people even leaned out of hatches to see what was going on. Captains never walked that quickly unless someone's pelt was about to be nailed to a barn. Vice had gathered up as much juice as she could. Now she was going to have to do some fairly distasteful things to get the Rho Theta house in order. The call could come at any moment. 
and if there were any confusion about duty and the chain of command, it was going to put lives in danger, most of them civilian. The captain marched into the station's deck three operations center and took one look around. A third-class petty officer sat with his back turned and his feet propped on the console. The only reason he wasn't yanked out of his chair by one of Mallory's MPs was because he noticed the battalion marine at the opposite end of the control center come to attention. He turned and looked up into the face of total disaster and scrambled to his feet. Where is the duty officer? Rogers asked. Uh, sir. Sir, he, uh... He went to fusion control for a... He went to... As you were, mister, Rogers said. Vice squinted. The regulations regarding control facility shift personnel aboard orbital stations are clear, petty officer. No fewer than four on duty and present, correct? Yes, ma'am. See to it the regulations are followed from this moment on, or the next time I come through that hatch, hell follows. The look in the captain's eyes was unmistakable. Aye, ma'am. Commander Rogers, I want the detail aboard Command 2 to assume control of this watch for the next two hours. Very good, Captain. Mallory spoke next. Have the first rotation officers and crew report to the deck to executive conference on the double. Ma'am? The first rotation? Sabrina took a step forward. The petty officer ceased speaking and stood at attention even more strenuously. Despite the fact she wasn't quite as tall as the lanky enlisted, the look in her eyes told him everything he needed to know about her patience level. Petty Officer Richards, I want you to know you're a famous man, Mallory said, because you're going to be present when I repeat an order for the very first time in my career. During the brief pause, the temperature in the control facility dropped three full degrees. The acting commander's eyes did not move at all as she spoke. Have the first rotation officers and crew report to the deck two executive conference right now. Is that clear? Petty Officer Richards, I want you to know you're a famous man, Mallory said, because you're going to be present when I repeat an order for the very first time in my career. During the brief pause, the temperature in the control facility dropped three full degrees. The acting commander's eyes did not move at all as she spoke. Have the first rotation officers and crew report to the deck to executive conference. Right now. Is that clear? Richards swallowed hard. Aye, ma'am. Carry on, Petty Officer, Vice said. She led her delegation back into the corridor towards the lifts. The distance from Operations 3 to the Magneto lifts was just under 70 yards. Vice and her group had covered approximately one-third of that distance when a yeoman appeared from a side cabin and ran alongside. Ma'am, Commander Foyt would like to know if there's anything we can... A stumble. Is there anything we can do to make your visit to Rho Theta Base more... The two Marines at the Magneto lift brought their weapons to ready. This was unusual enough to make both Rogers and Mallory reach for their sidearms. The two MPs drew closer to the captain. Vice reached the lifts, but the Marines would not budge. Stand aside, Corporal. Negative, ma'am. We have orders to secure the deck. The yeoman continued wheedling. Ma'am, if you would just take a moment to review this duty roster, I think you'll find that we have made considerable... That will be all, yeoman. Sir, I... Yeoman? Is there a policy aboard this station that when an officer issues an order, they are inviting debate? Mallory snapped. Negative, ma'am. Then follow the commander's order. Hesitation. Now. Aye, ma'am. Dismissed. Mallory stared the yeoman down until she retreated. Gentlemen, I'm going to give you a choice. Either you stand down or I will have one of these MPs take each of you into custody. Captain, we have orders. Now you have new orders. Five seconds. Commander Foyt was very specific, ma'am. The commander has been relieved of his duties. I am assuming command of this station under Skywatch Emergency Action Regulations. Stand. Down. After a brief pause, the two men moved their weapons to order and stepped aside, unsure if they were violating some kind of protocol in the process. Moments later, Vice and her fellow officers strode onto Deck 2. The atmosphere on the higher deck had a palpable air of exclusivity, as if nobody but the members of a certain club were expected. Surprised faces greeted the fleet officers and Mallory's marines all along the main causeway. A group of people had huddled in the center of the corridor. The others looked up a moment before Commander Foyt whirled to face Vice's group. Commander Foyt, you are hereby relieved. Commander Rogers has been posted to operational command. I would like you to confine yourself to your quarters until I send for you. Foyt's expression went white. There was no warning, no advance communication. Ma'am, I'm not sure I understand. I'm not here to start a conversation. Vice turned to the MPs. Sergeant, 
You and the Lance Corporal will escort the Commander to his quarters and confine him there until further instructed. Aye, ma'am. Commander? The military police officer gestured towards the crew quarters deck. Foyt gulped like a beached fish. His committee of other officers watched him led away by the two Marine MPs as if he had just been handed the death penalty. From some standpoints, he had. It was extremely rare for any officer to be relieved on the spot, especially by someone not in their explicit chain of command. Be that as it may, the regulations were quite clear. Any command grade officer, meaning any officer with a rank higher than senior lieutenant, was authorized to assign or reassign subordinate personnel at their discretion, especially in an active operational theater. While the chain of command was important and formed the backbone of Skywatch, the experience and responsibility of ranking officers was also viewed as indispensable. A military where everyone had to get permission to wind their clocks was never going to be an effective fighting force. As far as Captain Jocelyn Vice was concerned, any military where Jerry Foyt was in charge of a facility as vital as the Rho Theta-3 orbital base would be equally ineffective. She wasn't entirely sure who was responsible for his assignment, but at this point it no longer mattered. She had a job to do, and this next one was going to be even more difficult. Attention on deck! Nearly eighty people rose from their seats to stand at attention. At the entrance to the crowded Deck 2 executive conference, Captain Vice's fellow officers took their places alongside the double doors. The captain herself began to pace without ordering the room to stand at ease. It is time the personnel aboard this station be apprised of our situation. We are at war. This is no longer a window-washing detail. Your commander has been relieved. My science officer is now in operational command of this station and will remain so until I issue further orders. Who is in charge of flight deck operations and maintenance? I am, ma'am. Lieutenant Michael Bayliss. Lieutenant Bayliss, you're fired. Who is your second? The lieutenant stood rigidly, lips tight. Uh, I am, ma'am. Lieutenant J.G. Owens. Lieutenant Owens, you are now acting head of flight operations and maintenance. I want all 40 fighters assigned to this base, ready to go to war in two hours. Is that clear, Lieutenant? Aye, ma'am. Very well. There are five members of First Watch, one officer and four enlisted, who were absent without leave at 1900 hours station time two days ago. There are three other members of First Watch, including the duty officer, who were AWOL not ten minutes ago on Deck 3. If you are one of these eight people, please take one step towards the conference table. There were some hesitant moments and some sideways glances before eight of the station's personnel were all standing next to the conference table. I want all of you to consider the fact that dereliction is a court-martial offense. Captain Vice paced behind the eight fleet personnel as she spoke. I also want you to consider the lives you put in danger when you are not found at your post aboard a forward operational base. From this moment forward, regulations will be followed on this base to the letter. Commander Rogers has been granted the authority needed to enforce those regulations. I'm assigning a platoon from the Starship Fury's Mobile Security Command to assist him in his task. Vice stopped at the head of the table. You are the duty officer who left operations without authorization? Aye, ma'am. Name and rank? Senior Lieutenant Paul Jacobs. You are now Ensign Paul Jacobs. There were audible gasps. Captain Vice had just erased almost six years of the former lieutenant's career. You are prohibited from any supervisory post for a term of one year. Is that understood, Ensign? Jacobs's face had reddened considerably. His answer was forced. Aye, ma'am. Very well. I'm leaving the remaining reassignments to Commander Rogers. If I receive word of any more insubordination or dereliction by anyone in this command, I will personally give the order to have you stood up in front of a firing squad and shot. Nobody was willing to gamble on whether the captain was serious. We are at war, ladies and gentlemen. Vice stopped and put her hand to her ear. Commander, sound general quarters. The captain exited the conference room and hurried for the lifts. Fast attack frigate Psy Key, Raleo 2. Standoff orbit, Commander Jace Hunter commanding. Zoni Tixia prided herself on her ability to interpret SRS data. It was one of the key functions of a signals tech. If a commanding officer or section chief asks, What the hell am I looking at? The signal specialist has to be able to provide some kind of answer. What a starship can see, the old teaching went can make the difference in any operation. The short-range scanner banks were the workhorse eyes of the fleet, while the high-gain antennas were the ears. 
When whatever happened on the surface of Raleo 2 was picked up by the starship Psy Ki, the SRS banks got the best look. At least that was the theory. Commander Hunter had looked down probes in the sky at the same instant, and had even ordered her ship to employ energy-intensive multi-spectrum scans at a time when the relatively small vessel could least afford it. And yet, despite all the technology they had mustered, after an hour of trying to interpret the data, Zoni still couldn't make heads nor tails of what had actually happened on the planet's surface. Any luck? Yili was stirring creamer into a coffee-filled smash-em-up cup. Skywatch Fleet's nickname for the ersatz hot beverage containers dispensed by the autoserve machines in hallway galleys. Zoni didn't answer. Uh-oh, I know that look, and that non-answer, Yili said. She stood at the light table in what had been designated as the new Psy Ki war deck. The playback of the SRS visuals went by at five frames per second. The pickups had been trained on an area near what everyone had agreed was the obelisk Colonel Atwell had mentioned in so many of his stories about the Ithis and their galactic civilization. The man identified by Skywatch Intelligence as the Denominator emerged from the structure carrying something in his hand bright enough to cast sharp, intense shadows in every direction. The energy readings and distortion from the obelisk suddenly shifted and began moving in the direction the denominator was traveling. And then everything went white. You need sleep, Commander. You've been at that light table for hours. I've never seen anything like this, Zoni replied. I have 40 minutes of full-spectrum readings tracking this guy from his ship to the obelisk and then back out into the atmosphere again. And all I can say for sure is he isn't Colonel Atwell. Possible Atwell was concealing his identity? Jamming our instruments? Yili asked, taking a sip of the fleet's best coffee. Commander Tixia and the Master Chief had made a point of transporting the Ajax Argent coffee brew to their new command. Chasing down end-of-the-world maniacs was one thing. Doing it while enduring bad coffee was simply not going to be tolerated. It's possible. I can't vouch for any of these readings. What I can say is whatever he carried back out of that structure had its own gravity. Well, doesn't everything have its own gravity? According to these gravimetrics, sufficient mass would have made him a half-ton heavier, even on Raleo 2, and as you can see, he's almost running when he re-establishes loss with Probe 4. I'll be pickled, Yili said. Raleo 2's gravity is what, 0.7 Terran? That thing's the size of a football and it weighs 1,200 pounds? If these gravimetrics are accurate, Zoni said, rewinding the playback, you're not buying it. Everything goes white 2.7 seconds after he emerges. There's no way he could have detected Probe 4, or us for that matter. We were geosynchronous at an altitude of 318 miles. Probe 4 was 9 degrees off our polar intercept at an altitude of 211 miles. Even with all the right equipment, he would have needed a half dozen passes to localize, and even then he would need even more gear to overload the wavelengths. Couldn't do all that in three seconds. There's something else going on here, engineer. Something jammed our instruments with technology I've never encountered. Let me stop you right there, Commander Pink. There is no way Jace is going to authorize a trip to the surface. Zoni looked up. She has to. It's the only way to run down the facts. Now let's get this straight. This is a hunter we're talking about. If she gets it in her mind something down there is dangerous, she'll let me go. Sure. With a squad of paranoid marines armed with rocket launchers. Okay, I'll recruit a landing party and we'll arm ourselves. You're going to have to tell her why. Zoni rewound the footage again. Because if what I suspect is true, we can solve the mystery of that obelisk and everything we discovered at Bayone. Curtis left the signals expert to her SRS telemetry. Zoni wasn't entirely sure yet, but there was something unusual about the whiteout. It wasn't the fact that it happened. It was the way it happened. Commander Tixia had reviewed thousands of hours of SRS data in her career and in her time at the Academy. It was a truism in the Signals Corps that all the best stuff always happens at the beginning and the end of any given tape, as the blocks of telemetry data were called. For whatever reason, unusual readings always seemed to congregate at the beginning and end of the readings. When it came to the footage from Probe 4, the truism was starting to have its usual effect. The commander was zeroing in on the last 0.68 seconds of information recorded by the probe. After that interval, the device stopped trying to gather information likely due to the fact it was unable to do so. When look-down probes encountered such situations, they responded by transmitting a loss-of-signal error, also known as low-sig. 
Probe 4's low SIG was received right after the 0.68 seconds of unusual information it recorded. Somewhere in the visual interference and static was what Zoni began to suspect was rather important information. If she stuck with it, she might be able to coax it out of the storm of nonsense in the last bits of SRS telemetry. Zoni scrubbed back to the beginning and slowed the playback to three frames per second. Advanced Strike Cruiser Fury, CX plus 704, Rho Theta 4 Deflection Zone, Lieutenant Commander Thomas Huggins commanding. The view from the tactical display was enough to give even seasoned officers vertigo. There were at least a hundred transports, and the entire armada was being escorted by bracket formation assault frigates. Every myth about Sarn preparedness had now been rendered both academic and moot. This was no idle attack. This was a full-on invasion force, and they were only 12 million miles from the surface of Rho Theta IV. The truth of it all became sickly clear when the tactical map was expanded to include the Descartes jump gate and the perimeter of the nearby Mycenae SETI system. Not only had the enemy formation traversed open space in part, but they had used the jump gate to mask their transports until they were in system and too close to the planet to be engaged in deep space. Now they were too close to the planet for some types of strategic engagements, which meant a combined counterattack, and the logistics of that kind of operation did not favor the Alliance. The one and only bright spot for the core forces was that Proxima had come through. The dreadnought Kuta had finally been reinforced by her battle group and by the King's own flagship, HMAV Seifer. The largest of the Proximan battleships displaced a full 4 million tons and was armed with a combination of energy batteries and heavy capital missiles. Although her escorts were not as formidable en masse as constitutions, the Proximans made up for lack of tonnage with numbers. Seifer was leading a miniature fleet of 21 total vessels, including frigate and destroyer-class hulls. With the enormous Proximan warship was another formation of smaller ships of a design Commander Huggins did not recognize. The largest vessel in the squadron appeared to be roughly 40,000 tons, and seemed to be heavily armed with missile launchers of a type unfamiliar to anyone on Fury's Bridge. It didn't look like the little ships would have much to offer in terms of firepower. But given the mismatch in hulls and tonnage, Skywatch certainly wasn't going to turn away help. It was not uncommon for unusual allies to emerge in the face of all-out war. The inhabitants of the star systems east of Sarn and Kraken's space were well aware of the fate that awaited them if the Alliance were defeated. Acting to preserve their own lives was to be expected, and like the indigenous populations of long ago, they brought whatever arms they could muster. Sir. I have a priority message from the flag. On screen, Ensign. Huggins braced himself for the order he had known was coming for months. He desperately wished Hunter were here instead of in the Raleo system. He knew how vital her mission was, but it was times like these when the good guys needed their best captains. Hunter and Islington were the kinds of officers who could turn the tide on their own. Heaven only knew what Islington in particular would accomplish if she could bring her unique tactical talents to a ship with more firepower. The entire Perseus line had seen firsthand what she had accomplished with a tiny escort frigate. But like all Skywatch captains, Huggins knew battles were fought with what was at hand, and right now, Task Force 9 had the point against some 80 enemy vessels desperate to land ground forces, roughly half a million strong on a planet at the heart of their defenses. This is Admiral Tucker aboard Constitution. This is what we get paid for, boys and girls. I am ordering a fleet opposed invasion. Target, row Theta 4. Stay in formation. You are weapons free. Stay alive because there will be a round two. Flag out. There it was. The talking was over. All the preparations and suspicions had led to this. The Sarn Armada's capital ships emerged from the starry distance as the cruisers Fury, Spruance, and Montpelier stood defiant in the path of their armies. Commander Francis Teller's bridge crew was as smooth and efficient as ever. Some might have concluded Spruance had gotten even more effective since the engagement at Station 19. The ship herself had been repaired and upgraded with a new SRS loadout. While she didn't have... Spruance's main battery flashed to life, spearing the darkness with white-hot strobes of magnetically distorted plasma energy. The bolts vanished into the extreme distance, only to detonate into ghostly spheres of expanding destruction. Again and again her weapons reported. Along the leading edge of the invasion force, shields began to burn against the relentless energy releases. Moments later, 
the even heavier weapons of Montpelier joined in. A cheer went up on the decks of Tucker's flagship as the first Sarn transports succumbed to a particularly well-aimed concussive burst. An orange fireball briefly lit up space, only to reveal the endless march of enemy vessels behind it. It was like some bizarre tribute to the British armies in the American Revolution. They just marched ahead, relying on numbers to discourage their opponents. The two escort destroyers closest to the funeral pyre of the destroyed transport returned fire. Their target was Commander Stone's larger ship. As the smaller emplacement energy fire crashed into her port quarter battle screens, the big cruiser reoriented her launchers for a maximum spectrum missile attack. A weakness in the core battle line emerged almost instantly. Kuda and Seifer were on station on the far side of the planet when the first elements of the invasion force emerged. While this presented the Alliance captains with some flexibility, the very last thing Tucker's forces needed was to split their strength into even smaller groups. The two big ships were not designed to deal with dozens of nearby opponents on their own. Their strength was in their ability to survive slugging matches with far more distant opponents. The Sarn formations were organized exactly the way Huggins would have arranged them. The transports were being escorted by energy and missile platforms with overlapping fields of engagement and fire. If the battleships threw punches at these tiny combatants, even if they scored mission kills, it would be a fantastic waste of firepower. There were reasons hunters didn't tow howitzers into forests looking for elk. Cannon and artillery were more than capable of killing a deer, but they weren't exactly the optimal weapon for the job. They have to make a run for it, sir. If they get caught out there alone, they'll be chopped to pieces along with anything we send to rescue them. Commander Francis Teller was the voice of reason on the task force battle conference. Tucker studied the tactical map and concluded the Kuta and the Seifer had about two minutes to spare if they threw everything they had into flank velocity. Do it, Commander. Put them on a counter-orbital course and get them behind the cruiser line. Al, I want your mobile defense to start heading for western latitudes. If you can get to Point Foxtrot, and then follow the tangent as they hit atmosphere, it will give you the best possible selection of ranges. Get your ground formations dug in, and make sure all your energy screens are at full operation. They're going to pound hell out of 10th Marines the moment they reach orbital range. Acknowledged, Admiral. Good hunting. The square section of the display where the Marine commander's transmission had been was replaced by the carrier signal for decor. Get me a status on readiness for reflector base. They're going to be dropping automated ground shock charges into that ice and then into the water. I want them ready to start taking out as many of those units as possible. Acknowledged, Admiral. The Constitution Bridge was arranged exactly the way Buford Tucker wanted it. The consoles were basically manned by two dozen junior officers, whose job was to convey the Admiral's orders and then relay the results. By now the whole operation was running about as smoothly as any capital ship bridge in the fleet, largely because the Admiral had his own way of doing things and because he had a unique talent for turning his bridge crews into fanatics. What's the status on Black Prince? Constitution Signals Tech checked the battle conference status board. Captain Vice is still in transit, sir. Her signals officer reports they will be underway in five minutes. Bullshit, five minutes. Open a channel. The main viewer on Tucker's bridge displayed the mounted night emblem for Captain Vice's ship momentarily. The officer of the watch responded to the hail. Black Prince standing by. Get your ass in the war, Lieutenant. We are awaiting the arrival of Captain Vice, sir. We will be underway in 60 seconds. Well, that's one hell of a lot better than five minutes. Flag out. The signals tech closed the channel. All right, pilot. Let's stretch the rubber band a little. Plot a new course 101 mark 60. Weps, where in blazes are you? Main battery standing by, Admiral, came the snappy reply over the 1MC. Very well. Radiation protocols, Commander. She's a tough bird, but she's getting a little saggy around the hips. We might spring a leak or two here and there. Acknowledged, Bridge. Ready to engage on your signal. Notify engineering I want their best 4x4. Helm, all ahead battle speed. The pilots and captains of the Saratoga and Myrmidon were surprised at the suddenness with which Tucker's battle wagon banked out of her station near RT-3's deflection zone. They matched course to keep up. Circe, Excalibur, and Delos followed, making sure to keep all the ships in the formation within their defensive envelopes. Saratoga in particular was going to be a crucial component in the Skywatch strategy. She was one of the heaviest missile platforms in the fleet. If she truly got the bit in her teeth, she would be able to rain unholy destruction down on enemy formations from extreme ranges. 
All Tucker had to do was catch the right ships at the right intervals and then lead them enough to get Saratoga's birds to arrive at the exact right moment. Black Prince, meanwhile, lingered. Jocelyn Vice came through the deck, one egress hatch like a sorceress chasing thieves. Bring us up loud and fast, Helm! Match course and speed with the flag! Battle screens to maximum! The captain began lacing the con shock harness around her shoulders. She looked up just in time to see the visual representation of the ancient Visigoths pouring over the last hill. A wall of fighters at least 600 strong was sweeping over the transport armada. It was exactly the eventuality Rho Theta was least prepared to face, and also the one they least expected. The telemetry was already coming in. These were not the same fighters Flotilla 29 had encountered over El Rey 5, nor were they the same ones that had hit Prairie Grove. These were heavier, better armed, and more maneuverable. Open a channel to the base. You're on, Captain. Gil, give me some good news about our fighters. A pause. I can get half of Cavalier 10 in space in an hour. The man may as well have sounded the chimes in an abandoned church. There was no longer any question for whom the bells tolled. Now it was just a matter of how many fighting men and women were going to die. What are your orders, Captain? At this point, Gil, all I can ask you to do is survive. Black Prince out. The last of RT-3's ships departed the planet's orbit on a fast intercept course for the RT-4 deflection zone. It would remain to be seen if the Sarn realized the station was defenseless. As her ship accelerated into the wakes of the rest of her task force, Captain Vice considered the events of the past few days. It never ceased to amaze her the capacity some people had for ignoring the truth. The threat to the Rho Theta region had been as clear as a bell for months now. Sarn activity in core space was not a theory, nor was it a scenario, as the intelligence analysts liked to describe it. The losses of TF-92 and Captain Vance's formation were proof enough for anyone willing to face facts. The near destruction of Task Force Achilles and Admiral Hafnitz's brush with death should have been all the confirmation necessary to get the Alliance off the mark. And yet there were still ranking officers like Jerry Foyt, who seemed to think their assignments were licensed to second-guess every other command in proximity to their own. Vice had done what some captains would have avoided. She knew some of the personnel in that executive conference meeting would recognize her motives. She also knew some of them might recognize the crisis moments before they perished in the attack they had failed to prepare for. The presence of a flag officer in his flagship wasn't enough to get the message across. Perhaps even her own direct actions weren't enough either. What Vice knew beyond any doubt was her words had arrived far too late. She resisted the urge to blame herself. She had turned Black Prince into one of the fleet's finest warships. She hoped her penchant for defending the lives of others wouldn't cost her crew their lives besides. She couldn't be held responsible for the laziness of a man who didn't belong in command. It was undeniable, but it wasn't going to prevent her from feeling the cruel tug of guilt. People who rose to the rank of captain rarely had the luxury of blaming the next guy. What if she had recognized the problem sooner? Would it have mattered? Despite all her instincts and power earned by virtue of her rank and assignment, and as frustrating as it was, there were still some things beyond her reach. She couldn't personally protect the crew of the station, even though she would if she had the option and the power to make it happen. Jocelyn Vice had recently come to the realization there were far too many people she couldn't save. She understood well the inevitability of defeat. Sooner or later, no matter how skillfully she wielded her sword, either those she sought to protect would perish or she would. True enough, someone would take up her blade and fight on. But how many would she have to save to pay for the ones she couldn't? The Black Prince rode on, sword at the ready, with Death himself waiting patiently over the next hill. Raleo Inversion Landing Party 2 L.T. Devon Leach commanding. The interior of St. Andrews was that special kind of dark that happened on overcast days when the sun was near the horizon. Lieutenant Leach often surmised it was darker than night, if that were even possible. The bite in the crisp air reminded him of the minutes before a storm, even though he was positive there was no chance of rain. His party's stark artificial lights flashed back and forth as the team worked in a two-by-two -two formation to clear the facility. What have you got, Abel Crewman? Life signs in the vicinity, sir. Can't lock their location, Thule replied. Probably some level of lead in the stone used to build this place, Abel Crewman Robinette replied. Could be responsible for the interference. 
What about structure? Leech replied, playing his handheld torch across the ceiling. The rotted straw and wood framing looked worn. There was nothing remarkable about the larger rooms. The furniture was gone, which the lieutenant thought was odd. Otherwise, the place looked and felt abandoned. There's a basement roughly half the square footage of the main level. Living quarters are located on the second floor bearing 116. The team moved slowly up a narrow passage towards an open window. The curtains looked as if they had been dipped in mud. Life reading, Thule said quietly. Clean signal, bearing 325, 15 yards. Leech raised his blaster and pointed the torch with his off hand. The squad moved as one up the hall to an open doorway leading to a side chamber. The lieutenant leaned forward. The girl was maybe 14 years of age. Harmless, except for the fact she was pointing a Sarn disruptor pistol at Leech. Thule moved to the edge of the doorway behind the lieutenant and ran a fast biometric analysis on the girl. Leech held his hands up and stepped into the room. We're not going to hurt you, I promise. The girl's hand trembled. You stay back. I've seen flintlocks. I know what they can do. Her hair and clothing made it look like she had been roaming the village for days. Leech wasn't a doctor, but he guessed she was malnourished. She had definitely been wearing the same clothes for a while. You're right. It would do a lot of damage. But you don't need to worry, because we're here to protect you. Now why don't you hand me that pistol and let's find you some water and something to eat. Leech did his best to keep his voice steady and reassuring. The girl's eyes told the story. The recent days of her life had likely been nothing short of catastrophic. It was something the lieutenant and all the other officers leading landing parties had been expecting. Nobody knew for sure what the denominator had done or said to these people. And it was a foregone conclusion none of them were prepared for the technology he had brought with him. Hell, the Skywatch crews pursuing him weren't prepared for the technology. There were so many unanswered questions. It was Leech's job, however, to make sure the answer to this question didn't result in dead crew members or civilians. He held his hand out. Moments earlier, he had done a magnificent job of slipping his own weapon under his tunic without anyone noticing. He smiled. Come on, we're here to help. The girl's eyes darted back and forth between the lieutenant and the three crewmen behind him in the doorway. It seemed like Leech's words had an effect because the tenseness in the girl's shoulders subsided. The weight of the gun she was holding rapidly overcame her strength. The weapon dangled in her grasp for an instant before Leech slid his fingers around it and expertly set the safeties. He breathed a sigh of relief when he saw it had been set on maximum power. One shot would have turned the southwest corner of the church into a two million degree cloud of protoplasm and debris. While two of Leech's squad members broke out some water and food for the girl, the lieutenant and ACFC Thule performed an analysis of the room. It was the only room so far they had found furnished, which was enough to raise the antennas of the landing party by itself. The presence of a disruptor pistol, and more importantly, a Sarn disruptor pistol, was more than enough to set Leech on high alert. It's not a mock up, sir. That weapon is charged and active. Heavy Cruiser Concordant CA 713, L Ray 2 Interdiction Zone, Commander Philip Hauer commanding. The situation aboard the only remaining Skywatch warship in the L Ray system was short of ideal. A handful of officers and men had found refuge in the ship's Sea Oxcon facility on Deck 10. They were fighting for information as valiantly as they were fighting for their lives. By now, Captain Hauer was running on sheer determination and almost nothing else. He was suffering from four fractures, including a cracked skull. He could walk after a fashion, but the pain prevented him from getting very far. And the stores of painkillers in the medical bag he had snatched off a dead Marine Corpsman were dangerously close to running out. His mind was a boiling sea of frustration punctuated by sudden surges of survival instinct. He had self-prescribed lethal doses of sedatives in order to reduce his heart rate, mainly because his rapid respiration threatened to overload what life support they had left. More than 200 men and women were dead. Concordant, his mighty ship, only one step removed from a capital platform, had been torn to ribbons by massed fighter attacks. Unlike so many other victims of Sarn aggression, Heavy Cruiser Hull 713 had survived, even if just about everything inside it was deactivated or dead. The captain was borderline obsessed with surviving, even though he knew once the crisis had passed, he would have to endure the nightmares for the rest of his days. The crew he had trained to go to war had been annihilated in a matter of minutes. He knew where the bastards were. He knew what they were preparing to unleash on his home 
and the innocent families that lived there. But from where he was, trapped inside a murdered starship with only intermittent life support and light, there were few options for fighting back. Nevertheless, Commander Philip Hauer had spent his entire career training for situations like this. He was determined to put that training into action. He knew the screams were waiting for him in his sleep, but he fully intended to survive anyway. The alternative was surrender, and that was not an option for a Skywatch officer. Is there any way we can stabilize our course and heading? If we do, we run the risk of popping up on the enemy tactical displays, sir, Science Officer Tarlin replied. Any expenditure of energy is risky. At the moment, we are a dark hole in space. If anyone even catches a match being lit, they could return and finish us off with one shot. Commander Howard drew on every last source of knowledge he had accumulated over his 17 years as a fleet officer. Disabled vessel survival was one of the most vital training courses for both officers and enlisted. Even auxiliary units and their leaders were put through at least two rounds of such training. The key lesson they learned was as simple as it was vital. Space is the most hostile environment known to man. There are a thousand ways it can kill you, and by the time you learn to beat it, you will be convinced it is trying to kill you. The only thing between you and space is your ship. From there, it wasn't difficult for the training personnel to preserve attention spans. All right, let's go through it again. Status report. All renewable power systems are dead. We have partial starboard battery power. Life support is operational on decks 10 and 13. Lights are only operational on deck 10. Engines out, weapons out, screens down. Main computer is operational on independent energy reserves. SRS banks port are partially operational at a low power level. Subspace transmitters are also operational, but not for long. Tarlin didn't sound enthusiastic about any of it. The captain was listening and thinking at the same time. Like most senior officers in a crisis, he was less interested in enthusiasm and more interested in the unconventional things his ship could do. What about El Ray 3? Concordance Tactical Officer spoke up. Flotilla 29 was on station at the planet before they maneuvered to ER-5, sir. That's all we know for sure. We picked up unusual readings on our Theta Wave antenna during the minutes immediately following the flotilla's change of course. We also know there was a massive energy release somewhere in the vicinity of ER-5, but unless we go active, there's no way to pick up any details. Theta Waves? From an abandoned defense base? Tarlin asked. The only way to produce that kind of energy is with rather specialized equipment. Aye, Commander. The science officer stared at his captain. For just a moment, the two men were thinking exactly the same thing. That base isn't abandoned. There's somebody down there, Hauer said. Landing party? Could be. Commander Drake had a marine detachment assigned for reclamation and exploration. And we know there was an operational base built on ER-3 about 60 years ago. But Skywatch stopped assigning personnel when the signals array was deployed. Whoever is down there may have been marooned. Tarlin looked around C. Oxcon, considering the alternatives. The facility was only partially lit. Almost all of the consoles were dark. The viewport at the far end of the cabin was large enough to see some distant stars. They gradually drifted across the transparent port as the ship drifted end over end. On each rotation, the brightness of the El Rey primary caused one corner of the window to glow for a moment. Then space darkened again. Power status. At present consumption, we will exhaust battery power in two days, Tarlin replied. We could extend that limit by a few hours if we disable artificial gravity in the cabin. That's useful, but it's going to have to be a last resort, sir, the tactical officer said. Without gravity, the stasis fields will be disrupted. That's true, Tarlin said. Well, we run out of water in three days, so a few extra hours isn't going to make any difference, the captain replied. We need options. As Howard re-inventoried the situation, he also made mental note of the fact five members of his crew had to be evacuated along with the other survivors. I need power, science officer. Mains are down. Auxiliary power is down. All we have are the batteries. What if those power systems are intact and just deactivated? That's possible, isn't it? It's possible. The problem is there are only a few rather limited means we have for evaluating those systems. If we light one of them up and it's not in a power-generating mood, we'd be striking a pretty good-sized match. The computer. It's operational. We might be able to get a manual interface from the command console. Use my identifier. See if it will grant you security access. Tarlin plugged the console back into the battery line. 
the device booted to a display of the Skywatch emblem, then shifted to a basic command interface. Two processes launched in the background. One was the standard security process designed to monitor user activity for anything unusual. The other began making repeated attempts to access the Concordance Cephalon core. Captain Hauer watched as his science officer queried the computer systems. His security credentials made things much less time-consuming, but what he found wasn't encouraging. The core itself had been automatically shut down to avoid unnecessary power usage. This was a response to the priority overrides every Skywatch vessel utilized. Life support and medical had unconditional priority. Medical, Hauer said in a contemplative tone. It's possible we could draw additional reserves, Tarlin replied. Thing is, in order to survey the power systems, I need the core. But if I power up the core, it's going to cut our battery power by at least 60%. We lose two days of life support. One day, three days. We don't gain anything useful by conserving our power, but we might gain something useful by expending it. Either way, we will have run out of water by then anyway, Hauer said. Activate the core. Tarlin reevaluated the situation. If he were in command, he might have given the same order. It didn't make him any less nervous, though. For all they knew, the core might light up with a runaway process that would drain the rest of the power with no way to stop it. Software and electronic errors could be remedied most of the time. A hardware failure, on the other hand, would be the end of them, because there was no way to reach the computer core. And even if they could, it might take hours and a large number of spare parts to restore proper operation in ideal circumstances. Tarlin hesitated. She's a tough ship, Lieutenant, Hauer said. She won't let us down. Aye. Hauer's science officer entered the command to query the Level 1 security interface. He switched the display to show the process list and monitor processor usage. The Oxcon devices were all smaller and less capable versions of those on the cruiser's bridge. The command console had a processor of its own and could perform rudimentary operations without access to the rest of the ship's information processing capacity. But that wasn't going to be all that helpful for the survivors. If there were any chance of restoring even partial main computer operations, coaxing the security systems back to life was the first step. Cephalon Processor 7E is responding, sir. We have access to approximately 2% of core memory. The system has granted me security access. What about core status? If we limit things to just the one processor and don't overload the memory, we can get readouts at this station. Find out where that processor is getting power, the tactical officer said. It might be connected to something we haven't accessed yet. Good call, Hauer said. Pull the processor for operational status. Tarlin typed out a command that took up five lines in the character display. The tactical officer understood some of it but there were redirects and variable substitutions that left him more than a little dizzy after a few moments. What the hell is all that? Hauer asked. The results of spending way too many late nights in my college computer lab. Why didn't you go into information processing? The tactical officer asked. I did. I wrote a game that almost cost me a year of credits before I transferred to the academy. Couldn't find what I wanted on the marketplaces. So I made it myself and played it until the wee hours five nights a week. We'll have to keep that in mind. The next time we have a computer emergency, we'll know who to call. What have we got? This console is now set up to pull processor 7E at regular intervals and to dump core memory to output on each pass. That will prevent us from crashing due to lack of writable addresses. As soon as there is any information worth printing out, the process will let us know about it. I gave priority to power systems, so 7E should notify us on its power status on the next pass. When? Four minutes. Outstanding. Hauer took the opportunity to check the stasis fields and to re-verify the seal on the life support systems for C. Oxcon. The main hatch was magnetically sealed to maintain air pressure and temperature, and the entire deck had been sealed off to prevent the spread of dangerous radioactive debris from the cruiser's mangled engines and reactors. The shadowy corridors outside the last refuge on Deck 10 were filled with floating bodies that occasionally bumped into bulkheads as the dead ship tumbled through space. Aside from the captain, science officer, and second watch tactical officer, the only other survivors were unconscious in stasis fields. Four were covered in specially treated bandages for the radiation burns. The fifth was on full life support and was likely already brain dead. A robotic nurse similar to Argent's Angel Rescue Units 
was controlling the stasis fields and doing everything possible to minimize their energy usage. Hauer had replayed the sudden destruction of his command over and over in his mind to the point of exhaustion. Lack of time prevented any response other than the one he ordered. Concordant fought to the full extent of her capabilities. Her weapons were exhausted. Her power systems had been shattered by wave after wave of fighter-launched missiles. Her engines were a trail of spinning, twisted metal some 60,000 miles long. The first wave crippled her. The second ripped her throat out. The captain remembered well the gruff words of a veteran enlisted the day he earned his first promotion to a command rank. All that twaddle you've heard about captains going down with their ships is a load of crap. If we're going to lose the ship, we damn well don't want to lose the captain with her. If your command is destroyed, get out and get home in one piece or so help me. I will follow you into the afterlife wearing my ass-kicking boots. The other lesson Howard had learned from the senior chief was that solutions were like prettier girlfriends. They were always out there, and most of the time they were as obvious as a brass band at a librarian's funeral. In fact, they were probably staring you right in the face. Tarlin, pull up deck surveillance for the flight line. If it's still operational, the commander muttered, subsystem power has to be rerouted. The science officer worked with the crude console the three men had commandeered. It was their only lifeline to the rest of the ship. The tiny, five-inch-wide viewer flickered and finally stabilized on an off-angle view of the almost pitch-black expanse on Concordance 18th and ventral most deck. Lights. Sir, we barely have enough power to keep the lights on here, Tarlin half-whispered. One light. Hauer nodded at his third in command. The captain was making plans, and that was just enough to give the young officer hope they might escape. After a few moments of fiddling with the half-operational command interface to the ship's deck power subsystems, the entry hatch light snapped on. At the extreme edge of the area of illumination, the captain could see that Command Shuttle 2 was intact. That's our plan B, gentlemen. In fact, if we can get partial power restored, we will be able to relocate to the flight deck and find some better accommodations for our injured. Tarlin watched the console, waiting for the data to come through. Imperial Blade Cruiser Zelo. Waypoint Uniform India. Fourth Cloud Dragon Gurgle, the Butcher commanding. The High Command has been informed, Cloud Dragon. Excellent. Behold the humans. One wonders if they hear the sounds their comrades make as they are swept from space. Google gestured to his flagship's main viewer. On it, a tactical map of the core frontier sprawled, indicating the Empire's latest intelligence regarding the deployment of the Alliance forces. More than 200 starships were either in position or in transit along a front stretching almost 60 light years. At its center, the Shasta jump gate was prominently marked, along with more obscure transit hubs reaching far enough into human territory to threaten the Core 5 system. Their defenses appear formidable. They are. But surely you can see what they are most concerned with defending. The strength they have concentrated at Rho Theta. Why? What is so precious to them about those planets? A weakness, Cloud Dragon. An opportunity. The supply lines for their defenses are wholly dependent on the Blackburn and Missouri gates. If we can seize positions here, here and here we can drive their weakly defended columns all the way back to Vicksburg base and leave both jump gates undefended. Once altered to match our codes and drive signatures, they will be unavailable to the Alliance. As he spoke, Gurgle indicated three small star systems nestled between Core 5 and the Missouri gate. Aside from the heavy transit station marked in one of them, none appeared strategically significant aside from their posture between core space and Rho Theta. They formed a natural choke point, and they led to an unavoidable conclusion. Only two jump gates were available to facilitate transit for military and civilian traffic. The Butcher was right in one respect. If those two jump gates were cut off, it would leave Rho Theta dangerously isolated. The Proximans? Their idealism will be their downfall, Socrat. Behold the positions of their heaviest hulls. The display shifted to highlight Proximan ships. A tight concentration of icons representing Crest of the Proximan King appeared in the Rho Theta system. Not only will they be unable to defend their allies, they will be unable to defend their home system or Jenner's star. They don't even have enough firepower to engage the invasion force, Socrates said, as he performed the mental calculations to measure Task Force 9's potential against what he knew the Sarn were moving from Mycenae Seti through the Descartes Gate. Gurgle rose from his barbed and sharpened throne. 
He paced to the view screen as he spoke, his cape trailing. The humans will be compelled to divert the Kentucky and the Ireland to reinforce their defenses at RT4, Gurgle replied. Their northern banner is commanded by an admiral with meek aspirations. He is no warrior. He is what the humans call a politician. He is far more concerned with comfort and routine than with glory. He will fail to rally his men and will leave at least one of those three systems with understrength defenses. We will find that system. We will target it, conceal our forces there, and wait for an opportunity to disrupt their freighters. Their fleet is more experienced than ours, Cloud Dragon. I would counsel you against overconfidence. Fear not, my friend. We have the advantage. What do you believe that could be? The Bloodwing, Socret. Our pilots endured much to become so capable in so short a time. By now the humans are just beginning to realize the Empire's total dedication to strike fighter operations. They will have neither the numbers nor the firepower to withstand our squadrons. Now that Elder Dragon Orn has seized control of the El Rey system, it will only be a matter of time before we can launch long-range strikes against Manassas and the remaining civilian targets in Prairie Grove. Our fighters have received the necessary upgrades already? Sokrit's voice rose in a tone of wonder. They have. Once we have captured jump gates at key strategic positions along the core frontier, we will be in position to strike Dante's twins, Manassas, and Jupiter. The humans will move to reinforce those systems to protect the civilians. When they do, we will catch them out of position and destroy them task force by task force. Sokrit stared at the tactical display as it pulled back to reveal the entirety of core space. They will be fighting on three fronts, but so will we. They will be dying on three fronts, and when we spring our final surprise, they will be surrounded and unable to do anything but sue for peace. Surrounded, Socrat thought, his attention centered on the only system that could produce such a strategic result. Epsilon Gamma, fast attack frigate Psy Key, Raleo 2, standoff orbit, Commander Jace Hunter commanding. Well, which is it, impossible or improbable? Hunter sounded very much like her brother when confronted with not quite specific enough answers. Scientifically speaking, highly improbable, Commander Curtis replied. In a room full of non-scientists, impossible. Go over it again. Zoni rewound the SRS visual pickup telemetry to the beginning of the feed. The target entered the Raleo 2 obelisk at time code 0815. Got it. Hunter had her arms folded. He exited at time code 796. Zoni scrubbed the visual record back 19 seconds. Sure enough, the same individual exited the structure this time carrying the object Zoni had identified as the artifact. The look on the commander's face told the engineer and her fellow officer this wasn't going to be one of those light-hearted briefings. He exited the structure before entering it? The technical term for what happened here is a temporal inversion. For us, time ostensibly moved forward at its normal rate, but for him, time moved backwards. We perceived events taking place in the wrong order, while he experienced them in the correct order. But we still don't have a fix on him. That is correct. I had to go back and pull this series of readings because everything after time code 846 indicates no life forms on the surface, and no evidence they were ever there, Zoni said. That's leaving aside the fact he was on the surface for at least six minutes without life support. Given the temperature, the extraordinarily low air pressure, and the radiation from the Raleo primary, if he is human, he wouldn't have lasted six minutes. Where the hell is Dr. Doverly when we need her? Yili muttered. All right, let's stipulate for the moment you are correct, Hunter said, her face and eyes filled with that peculiar combination of annoyance and short-temperedness unique to starship captains. Where is he now? Since he is traveling in space-time instead of just space, he could be somewhere in our past. How do we locate him then? We don't have to, Yili said. If this is really a temporal inversion, then it is radiating outwards from its source on the planet's surface. Meaning we have to go down there, Hunter said. I need to send landing parties to the surface of Raleo 2, a planet now responsible for the outright disappearance of at least three starships, and the place where Colonel Atwell, our current fugitive, and Admiral Hughes all went mad. Well, at least one of us is on the comeback trail. Vice Admiral Hughes stood in the doorway to the Sai Key briefing room. Hunter should have looked surprised, but she wasn't. My apologies, sir. I meant no offense. Think nothing of it, Commander. I'm giving no orders on this mission. I'm just here in an advisory role. Admiral? 
you experience the Ithis presence in a way none of us have. Do you have anything to add regarding this planet and its effect on our instruments? Zoni asked. All I can say for sure is that every time we experience the shifts caused by our use of their mechanisms, it was possible for us to be in two locations at once. I suspect your theory about temporal inversions is accurate, because if they made it possible to disrupt space-time and to travel temporally from one location to the next, then it would be possible for one or more of us to be in two different physical locations at once in the same space. Good point, the Master Chief added. Fits in nicely with their teleportation device. Instead of being in two places at the same time, Zoni started. You're in two places at different times, the Master Chief replied. Is it possible we're already somewhere else and don't know it? Yili asked. The commander activated her comlink. Hunter to bridge. Bridge Roscoe. Report our current position. Psy Key is in a geosync orbit over target coordinates. Altitude 260 miles. Report all contacts. My only contact is Unicorn 7, bearing 114 stationary at 2 million miles. Acknowledged. Hunter out. Minstrel. Buckmaster asked. Guarding the front door along with our cybernetic attack dog, Hunter replied. Apparently we're here and not there. What about the surface? Yili asked. We can tie into the ship's surface scanners here, Zoni said. She configured the universal and switched the Psyche's feed to the wall monitor. The display showed a dark structure of some kind on an amber-colored field. What the hell is that? Hunter asked. It's not Raleo 2, Buckmaster said. Looks like Nebraska in the fall. Even the Admiral took a few steps forward to get a better look. What did you do? Yili asked. I just reconfigured the surface scanners to filter for TIE particles. Our normal SRS sweeps filter them out automatically, even though they are usually just noise. And you left them in? Zoni nodded. This is what the planet looks like if we scan for unusual effects on time, which can only be produced by an energy source that generates TIE particles. But that's not Raleo 2, Hunter said. That's a wooden structure at the left edge of the display, and that kind of flora can't grow this close to a B-type star. That's correct, Commander. This isn't Raleo 2, this is Earth. Wolfpack Formation Lichen Spear, X-Ray Tango Interdiction Zone. Commander Torlan Zweiger, Commanding Sir, we've lost contact with the outbounds. Commander Zweiger was studying the tactical display intently. There was something about this situation that tugged at his better instincts. He couldn't quite put his finger on it but his impatience was growing by the second. Raise the New Hampshire. Send them our telemetry and get me some answers. The commander began pacing his own bridge. DSS New Hampshire was identical in every way to the other three ships in her squadron, save for one detail. She was equipped with specialized long-range scanners. If any of their number could find the missing Sarn warships, it was their number four hull. Zweiger was reminded of the joke about rabbit chasing. The thing was, they didn't chase two rabbits. They chased one, and it got away. And the more he thought about it, the more the commander realized his squadron might have been played. Sir, New Hampshire reports no contacts on any bearing along the Manassas approach. They're gone. Get me a status update from the repeater at System's Edge. Platmore Field. Sir? Hurry! The commander had finally stopped pacing, standing next to his main view screen on the bridge. His insides were doing somersaults. The firepower issue was being put to the test, and the Sarn were one step ahead. If his suspicions were correct, the enemy was about to spring a trap where it would be the most dangerous. Skywatch would respond bravely, as they always did, and then they would be ripped to pieces by overwhelming force. Zweiger knew how it was going to happen, and he knew why. He didn't know where. He could guess, but then he would be risking the exact same mistake he had just made running off after two outbound contacts that made it look like they were joining an assault on Manassas. The star maps depicting the region between the Shasta and Missouri jump gates were among the most detailed in the fleet. The three star systems on the direct route from Core Prime to Rho Theta were the first humanity explored to any great degree, largely because they were the first reached by the jump gate network discovered just outside Core Space in the years following the invention of the Cantlon Drive field. Siege Island was mapped by automated satellites looking for precious ores and liquid water. Platmore Field was the first system of the three to host a human colony. Athena's Shield was where the earliest deep space military installation was established. As the oldest command in all of Skywatch, the mighty listening post at Athena 3 was almost considered holy ground. 
The idea of it being attacked and destroyed was beyond the imagination of anyone with even the most tenuous connection to humanity. Even during First Praetorian, the Athena system was spared most of the heavy fighting. The Sarn seemed far more interested in Siege Island, likely because the system had two additional planets, both of which had rocky surfaces and could serve as landing sites for mobile command bases, starship repair facilities, and power installations. The Sarn were well aware of the reverence for Athena's shield, and they were certainly in no mood to provoke any additional aggression from Allied forces during First Praetorian. For almost half the duration of the conflict, the Empire was broken and in retreat anyway. This time, however, it was anyone's guess if they would be belligerent enough to take a swipe at the listening post. If the commander's suspicions were correct, it would make strategic sense. Athena's shield would be the system that would alert Skywatch to any unusual activity first. Trouble was, Lycan Spear hadn't gotten anything from that region of space. Sir, I'm getting nothing but a stream of error messages from the repeater. Status? The transmitter is functioning, but all I'm hearing is gibberish. Notify the squadron we are changing course. Zweiger made his way back to the con and began fastening his six-point. Helm, bring the Vermont about. New heading 015 Mark II. All ahead emergency flank. Aye, Commander. Coming about to new heading. Now on course for the Platmore Field System approach. Four sleek attack destroyers banked sharply and screamed into the distant darkness. Firebase Stony Point. Siege Island Planetary Defense Zone. Lieutenant Commander Walt Ames commanding. We're ready, sir. If they come this way, they'll wish they hadn't. Very well, Commander. Coordinate your defense with the Chesapeake. Here is the tactical situation as we understand it. The battle conference display switched to a top-down view of the three star systems situated between the Missouri Gate and Core Space. Sarn forces are certain to challenge at least one space lane between Vicksburg and Rho Theta. We believe they will move on one of the systems bordering Siege Island in order to set up an ambush. Your job is to disrupt those plans, catch them out of position, and raise hell. Allegheny out. The officer delivering the briefing was none other than Captain Dennis Crowell. Admiral Powers was occupied as he often was with matters of state, supply formations, and the kinds of things only a flag officer can properly address. It was up to his chief of staff to issue orders in his stead. Crowell had access to all the relevant information regarding the situation beyond the Vicksburg base. From the Missouri Gate to Core Space, there were only two strategic positions for forward operating bases. One was Platmore Field, situated in a cramped star system approximately one light day from the Core Frontier. The other was Siege Island, named for the fact its planets were rumored to still radiate higher temperatures due to the rage and destruction unleashed over them in First Praetorian. The planet's commander Ames was in charge of protecting for the Alliance were in God's little half-acre in strategic terms. Far enough from home to be vulnerable, close enough to home to be dangerous. It was the key reason Siege Island was wired with enough high explosives and proximity mines to blow half of known space into spare parts and senecline dust. Ames knew the bastards were coming. He just wanted to make sure they had enough party favors so everyone could take home a prize. As it turned out, it looked like his guests were a little early. Proximity alert. System perimeter. Battle computer designates target hostile identifier Kilowatt Delta 1. Bearing 353 mark negative 5. Possible change in aspect. High energy turn in progress. The tactical station specialist read from her scope very much like the computer she had programmed to scan known space for anything that might look like an enemy ship. Commander Ames opened the standby channel to his hounds. Did you get all that, Mike? Affirmative, Siege Island. We've got them. Eight contacts in track. One heavy, now on high intercept course for SI-3 orbit. Exactly what I would do, Ames muttered. Where is the rest of your formation, Lieutenant? In your girlfriend's closet, Commander. Understood. Start the clock. I want these guys going gentle into that good night so fast they don't have time to clean up the puddle. Stand by. The enemy formation began to accelerate, bearing on a position from which they could establish a picket search pattern for the entire system. Their waypoint was obviously chosen to maximize range from the firebase they knew was nearby over SI-4. Making the Alliance forces come out to meet them put them in the driver's seat. What they didn't know was they were flying into a minefield large enough to create its own gravitational interference. Ames watched the ranges close on his tactical display. The battle computer plotted the estimated positions of the Skywatch forces nearest the orbital track for SI-3. The Chesapeake led a formation of destroyers that were powered down and drifting not far from the firebase side of the minefield. Once Commander Ames lit the fuse, 
Their orders were to charge into the deflection zone and ambush the Sarn formation while it was occupied with the mines. It was a battle plan that had been in the build-up phase for almost six months. It had to work. The alternative was the loss of Stony Point and the inevitable loss of the Missouri Jump Gate. Dividing Task Force 9 from support columns launched from Vicksburg would suffocate Rho Theta and put the Alliance on the defensive. All six of Senior Lieutenant Michael Pine's destroyers were armed with top-of-the-line long-range missiles. If the two formations got within range of each other, it was likely to touch off the largest release of firepower ever recorded in a single battle. Finally, the Kilowatt Delta Contact Formation moved close enough to the Siege Island SRS array for detailed analysis. Its capital ship was the Reaver-class Imperial Scimitar Bane. Escorting her were no fewer than eleven assault vessels, including the storied Venom Cruiser Summoner. They were half again heavier in tonnage, and had twice the firepower of the Skywatch Squadron. Ames's at-a-glance strategic estimates weren't encouraging. The minefield was only going to even the odds, not give the Stony Point defenders the edge they desperately needed. Skywatch didn't have a clear advantage other than surprise. Ames was under the gun now. His attack was going to have to be perfectly timed. The slightest miscalculation would be disastrous. If Pine's squadron launched too early, it would give the Bane time to shift formation and put its best missile killers far enough from the flagship to give them two shots at the first wave of birds, one from the defensive line and the other from the flagship and her heavier escorts. If Pine launched too late, the fire support from the mines would be diluted. The nature of battle screen technology dictated that if five bullets were to be fired, they would all have to arrive simultaneously. That gave the attacker the potential to knock the shields offline and potentially damage the defender. However, if the bullets arrived one at a time in what fleet tacticians called diluted fire, the screens were almost guaranteed to hold. Battle screens were designed to absorb punishment and then recover. The trick was to prevent the recovery phase by destroying them all at once. With a combined arms strike, the strategic imperative was to completely overwhelm the enemy formation with different weapon types. Energy and proximity burst to wear down its battle screens. Missiles to overtax its point defense. If all the attacks arrived on a precise enough schedule, the enemy commander would be forced to choose between reinforcing his shields to blunt the energy attacks, or throwing maximum energy into point defense and maneuvering at high acceleration to thin the inbound missile waves. He would have no choice but to commit to one or the other. Whichever he chose, Ames's challenge was to maximize fire from the countering weapon type. Both Ames and Pine were football players from their academy days. Both recognized the age-old strategic gambit. If the enemy shows past defense, run. If they bring their linebackers up to stop the run, throw. Both officers also knew defenses could bluff. At the moment, only a well-executed bluff would save the Bane and her formation. The two officers tasked with defending Siege Island were determined to prevent it. Time to perimeter contact. Four minutes. Give me a readiness report on the minefield. The tactical display shifted to what for all intents and purposes was another layer of space. The entire map took on a greenish tint as the positions of the more than 2,000 mines deployed along the orbit of Siege Island 3 became visible. Commander Ames's arsenal was truly sobering. Among the weapons he controlled were the Barrow Acquisition Platforms. These were essentially 500-ton space locomotives combining a thermonuclear penetration charge and an antimatter-powered X-ray burst warhead. Their yields were well into the 100 megaton range, meaning they could vaporize most vessels lighter than a cruiser. BAP mines were set to quietly acquire their targets. Once activated, they were programmed to engage anything under power without a Skywatch transponder. Once their targets were locked, the mines would tumble out of their assemblies and fire sprint engines at close range giving their opponent only a few seconds to attempt to engage them before impact. The assemblies each stored ten mines, all of which were designed to arrive simultaneously against single targets and to attack priority targets if enemy ships were operating in formation. BAP mines were the workhorses of Alliance Minefield Tech. Ames controlled more than 400 assemblies loaded with nearly 4,000 weapons. Deployed among the stealthy formations of BAP assemblies were the Widowmakers, these were essentially Spectre energy mounts on minimum power deep space platforms designed to acquire, lock, and then shower enemy contacts with proximity bursts. The mounts on the Widowmakers were the lightest and most energy efficient of the Spectre line. They had cycle times of just under 14 seconds, which meant they could hit a target with four multi-kiloton blasts in less than a minute. 
The variant Widowmaker platforms were identical to the originals, except they were all armed with Jaguar Mark II fusion torpedoes. As sexy as all those weapons were, they were positively tame compared to the Honey Badger Debris Bomb, a deranged weapons technician who went by the nickname The Janitor during his short stint at an Alliance weapons factory on Core 6 was quite taken with the idea of kinetic weapons. He was a skilled marksman, but eschewed energy weapons, preferring to hone his skills with old-fashioned powder and bullet firearms. He was unwilling to concede that energy weapons, advanced atomic reactions, and radiation had surpassed bullets as a means of conducting deep space warfare, so he set to work to prove his detractors wrong. The result was the ugliest, most cost-effective death contraption since the guillotine. The janitor's proposal was simple. If Alliance spacecraft had the technology to create artificial gravity and drive fields, then they most certainly had the technology to create anti-gravity, and to use that energy to warp a drive field until it became, for all intents and purposes, an electromagnetic trampoline. His initial experiments were about as entertaining as anyone had seen in their years at the weapons factory Skunk Works. The janitor created enormous test platforms consisting of multi-megawatt magnetic fields and lightning generators. He would create railguns that would hurl enormous blocks of iron at his magnetic screens until he had them tuned to the point where they would first slow and then deflect the incoming mass. Once he got his numbers to add up, he switched to anti-gravity fields and began the process of adjusting, tuning, and experimenting. Some weeks later, in the dead of night, he quietly shifted his focus from using the anti-gravity field as a barrier to using it as the impeller. He threw a baseball into the reaction field and clocked its speed at. 04C before it detonated against his makeshift battle screens. The simple flight of the baseball through the 96% vacuum in the chamber generated several thousand watts of power. Then he went to work. The janitor's reaction field was encased in a high energy capsule with a standard detonator and attenuation matrix. This basically created a gigantic anti gravity generator capable of hurling objects in one direction or all directions depending on its settings. The capsule was then packed at the center of several tons of dense scrap metal carved into three-foot sections. Far from elegant, each of the weapons looked exactly as one might imagine. They were essentially portable junkyards, with all kinds of bent and twisted shapes sticking out of them. They were unattractive, unorthodox, borderline silly, and frighteningly effective. His new invention announced itself by blowing half the research facility into fast-moving concrete and circuitry. His military supervisor remarked that he had created the world's most psychotic fragmentation grenade. Its practical effectiveness was proven only two weeks later when a single weapon annihilated half the hull of a decommissioned missile destroyer. When the military affairs attaché went to congratulate the janitor, he was gone. A three-month search ensued. The man was never found but all of his research was recovered from a secret storage compartment underneath the destroyed weapons lab. A monument to the missing weapons inventor is located at Allegheny. It is decorated with an artist's rendition of a honey badger, the janitor's favorite animal. Commander Ames was one beneficiary of the janitor's weapon expertise. He had 600 debris bombs deployed, each capable of throwing a barrage of several thousand spinning metal chunks in an effective engagement range of more than a million miles at velocities exceeding 5% light speed. Being confronted with such a weapon was decidedly inconvenient for most enemy warships. There were essentially two defenses, get out of the way or hope your screen's held. Enemy contact Kilowatt Delta-1 was only 20 million miles from the minefield's engagement envelope. The weapons under Commander Ames' control were powered down and operating on passives only. Their sensor suites were not the most sophisticated in the fleet, largely because they really didn't give a damn what they were engaging. Anything under power without a Skywatch transponder was subject to attack. That was the whole point of a minefield. It was to stop spacecraft from going to point B from point A. At the moment, the minefield's mission was the same as the Chesapeake Squadron. Stop Kilowatt Delta-1 from reaching Siege Island 3. Fast attack frigate Psy Key. Relay 2 Standoff orbit. Commander Jace Hunter commanding. With DSS Minstrel in open space on quiet patrol, Hunter put Psy Key into a more advantageous orbit. Her frigate was no longer as well concealed as it had been, but the new orbital altitude and position relative to the obelisk gave her instruments a much better vantage point for their analysis. Hunter wasn't satisfied with her ship's scientific facilities. This kind of investigation required a true science team with the latest gear. Granted, 
She had a couple of the fleet's most promising officers on her team, but they were hamstrung by their rustic laboratory. Commander Tixia had managed to upgrade their communications systems, but the right kind of lab gear was either present or absent. It couldn't be improvised, unfortunately. Zoni saw and heard the hail before anyone else. She presumed this was the moment Psy Ki would be contacted with the denominator's terms. After all, he had somehow managed to start utilizing the technology on the ground. Only Heaven knew what he would be able to accomplish with it. Commander Hunter's mission to stop him got more urgent each time the hail notification went off. Then the signals officer noticed something strange. The hail had a Skywatch identifier. Commander, we're being hailed by Lieutenant Leach. Hunter swiveled in her command chair and hesitated with a confused expression before replying. That's interesting. Lieutenant Leach is on deck four checking planetside gear for his landing party. Zoni just stared back. Of all the things in the world Hunter knew her brother's communications officer would never get wrong, it was a hailing frequency identifier. Put it on screen. The image of Devin Leach appeared. In the background was a shadowy chamber that looked like the set for a Charles Dickens theatrical production. Ready to deliver my report, ma'am. We found a girl here armed with a sarn disruptor. We haven't caught him yet, but I'd say we're on the trail of our man. Acknowledged landing party. Stand by. Hunter changed the status of the lieutenant's channel from her command console and activated the ship's 1MC. Lieutenant Leach report to the bridge on the double. The commander swiveled again and stared at Zoni with a special brand of the trademark Hunter. What the hell is going on? Look. Somewhere below, the battleship Argent's weapons officer was ostensibly hurrying to deck one. It only took him 40 seconds. Devin Leach appeared in the egress hatch for the bridge. Hunter calmly reactivated the hailing frequency. She stared at Leach as his own face appeared on the Psy Key Bridge view screen. Lieutenant, I'd like you to continue your search for any technology that is out of place. Report to me directly in 30 minutes. Affirmative? Yes, ma'am, the view screen Leach said. His counterpart on the bridge stood with his face draining of its color. Very well, Psy Key out. Hunter closed the channel and allowed the silence to reign for a few moments. Why do I have two lieutenants named Leach, when before I only had one? I never expected to be literally talking to myself, ma'am. Hunter turned to Zoni. Commander? The transmission we received was from the future. Or at least one possible future for us. So now we have to evaluate what we see and hear based on what timeline it originated from. What if I don't send the landing party? It will alter our history, Zoni replied. Yili's the real expert on temporal theory, ma'am. I just run the radio. Zoni smiled sweetly. Jace almost grinned, but somehow managed to keep a straight face. She turned back to Leech. Carry on, Lieutenant. Aye, ma'am. Zoni, we're going to need some kind of a briefing and some kind of procedure to make sure we don't inadvertently violate some kind of four-dimensional physics here. Aye, ma'am. Commander Curtis and I will do our best. Very well. Get me a status update on surface conditions and let's get our boots down there as soon as possible. Just out of curiosity, Commander, where is there, as you see it? Zoni switched the main display to a graphical representation of the starship Psy Key, occupying several different oval-shaped colored regions. The ship was at the center. One end of each of the six ovals all intersected around the center point. One of the regions was marked present day and location, while the others were marked alternate time and location, and numbered one through five. If we presume what is happening to this region of space is the result of a temporal inversion, then this is one of the theoretically possible models. Our ship is positioned at a certain physical location. So is our drive field. Since we've never actually been in real space since we arrived, it is reasonable to assume our physical location could correspond with the same locations in multiple timelines and in multiple physical representations of our own universe. How does that get me two lieutenants? Once he left the ship, he may have entered one of the alternate timelines. For him, time may have moved forward at a different speed. In fact, time may be moving at many different speeds for us relative to any alternate universes we might inhabit at the moment. No pun intended. Is there any way to track all this with any kind of specificity, or are we just guessing? Hunter asked. It's all theoretical until one or more of us inhabits one of the alternate timelines. Once we've landed, so to speak, then we might be able to determine when we are as well as where. All right, I want everyone on board briefed on all this, and you're in charge, Zoni. You and Commander Curtis will keep everyone up to date on all the variables. I want special care taken to make sure we don't inadvertently alter history or do something that might have ramifications elsewhere. Understood? 
Yes, ma'am. Very well, let's get to it. Your first meeting will be with the lieutenant and his landing party. Since we know what we're looking for now, I want them max attentive to the potential presence of alien technology on the ground. What is your best guess as to where they are headed? Ombersley, England, somewhere in the late 19th century. Skywatch Fleet Military Hospital, Core 4 Orbit, Vice Admiral Neela Hafnitz's recovery room. Benjamin Powers stopped in the doorway. Admiral Hafnitz was reading a book called Four Rabbits and a Horsey to a very attentive little boy snuggled next to her. Neela's glasses were perched right at the end of her nose. The little chains hanging off the temples made her look exactly like an elementary school librarian. The fact she was also a three-star flag officer and one of the most feared warriors in known space didn't seem to matter much at the moment. Her current mission did not involve standing up to humanity's enemies or leading a task force. It was to enthrall the tiny human next to her with the most exciting reading voice she could muster. Admiral Powers had to admit she was doing a pretty good job. He made a mental note to put four rabbits and a horsey on the grandkid's reading list at the first opportunity. Hafnitz looked up and recognized she would have to postpone the thrilling conclusion. She handed the book to the young man. Her daughter and son-in-law gathered up the little ones and politely made their way towards the hospital cafeteria. Powers gently closed the door. I'm not going to ask how you're feeling, considering we almost had to have you sedated to get you in here. Neela folded up her reading glasses and placed them on the side table. Monitors blinked and flashed silently behind her. The only side effect is the blurred vision, which I've had since I was issued glasses in first grade. Major Galveston is a fine physician. He goes a little overboard on the pain medication, but I know he's just being careful. How long was the procedure? Two hours. I'm happy to report I'm now equipped with a titanium plate in my head, so the next time I knock myself silly I'll have some protection. My chief engineer has already coined the phrase Armored Admiral. Powers felt a pang of regret. Neela really did look more like a grandmother and less like a military officer. She even had a shawl draped over her standard-issue hospital blanket. It didn't exactly go with her half-shaved head, but it was going to have to do. Powers was up against it as usual. I have a report from Captain Hunter. Hafnitz's expression didn't change. It was clear she wasn't yet a believer in the Hunter mystique. Granted, she had been gracious about Argent's just-in-time arrival and successful engagement against the Kraken forces that were threatening to destroy her strike fleet. But she also mentioned to Powers her squadron wouldn't have been there in the first place if Hunter had followed orders. It was up to Powers to explain the captain's mission and the fact Argent was operating under Powers' authority. That helped a little but there would still be some frost between Hafnets and Hunter for a while. He's developed some information about the attack, the one that took place before the Kraken arrived. That was enough to get Hafnets to sit up a little straighter. Up to now, nobody had reached any conclusions about the Taysan. There was nothing but suspicion. Was the ship destroyed from inside? Did someone actually just push anti-ship missiles out of the load bay and let them attack on their own? It seemed that nobody was of a mind to investigate it properly. While it was true that Jason Hunter could be a royal pain in the ass sometimes, his lack of concern with regard to the orthodoxy occasionally came in handy. At the moment, he was the only officer of any consequential rank doing any investigating at all. Do you know a destroyer skipper named Ray Flynn? Can't say I've heard the name. What's his ship? The Constellation. He was attached to Perseus during the Gitarran Affair. Jace Hunter's outfit. The same? Turns out Flynn dispatched his own investigators to Allegheny and Vicksburg. After poking around for a few days, they managed to buy a stolen data pack from a Yershin informant. Powers handed Hafnitz a black and white photograph still from the surveillance camera that captured the exchange. That led them to an abandoned apartment on Core 2. They tracked three contacts to the Jupiter system and actually managed to buttonhole them at Scaries of all places. Flynn's men offered them a fictional presidential pardon, and they swallowed it all, hook and sinker. They gave up the mastermind of their operation, and handed over proof an imposter was slipped aboard Tay San, just before Achilles hit the Blackburn Gate. But that would have required encoded ID, biometrics. All faked, with all the confirming information tampered with at Core HQ. They even managed to get a lead on Rhea Cooper, Captain Flynn's tactical officer. She was apparently kidnapped and replaced with another imposter before the Bayone engagement between Rhode Island and the stealth ship sent to destroy the Fury. Flynn checked everything with Skywatch intelligence. 
Turns out Assault Squadron 808 is on the trail of the kidnappers and may not know it. I ordered Constellation be underway in 24 hours to investigate. Then this morning, Flynn hands me this. Powers handed Neela a tablet device. She activated it and studied the telemetry from Epsilon Gamma 3. Is this accurate? Powers nodded. Far as we know, Jason thinks it's connected to Atwell's plot, and I can't say I disagree. My God, Ben. If they can put operatives aboard our ships like this, what other sabotage might be in the works? Who can we trust? Hunter and I have been quietly working on this problem for some time. I concocted a story about the captain needing time to rehabilitate and delivered false orders for Argent to stand down. Then I did some back-channel communicating. Jason's ship is fully crewed and provisioned and standing by at Gale River. Who's in command? Cochrane O'Malley. Hunter's new XO. He's a little more introspective than the rest of Jason's delinquent senior officers, but he's got the bit in his teeth on this one. If what we found on EG-3 can be confirmed, it might give us a lead on what to expect from the Sarn. I don't know how big this thing is, Neela, but I do know you were ambushed by whomever or whatever was behind the attack on the Constellation. And that means the loss of the Tyson is connected to what's happening on Epsilon Gamma 3. I wish I could be more help, Ben. I've got a couple of my own people out there in the hinterlands. Maybe I can scare up some information for you. My chief of staff will be by later tonight with a status report on the repairs for the St. Lucia and Rival. We have to be careful, Admiral. Hunter and I are conducting this operation off the books. If the wrong people find out what we're up to, it could get ugly. It could also force them to abandon whatever they have in the works, and that's only going to make it tougher to run them down. I know this isn't what you signed up for, Admiral, Neela said. We're supposed to protect our own, not fight them in our neighborhoods. What's the President's position? He made a big mistake by trying to recuse himself. That did nothing but embolden his political rivals, and it sent a real chill through the population. The man was elected on a get-tough platform. It did him no good to tuck tail the moment he was called on to act. They took his daughter, Ben. That was never confirmed. She was on M-74 when the hostilities broke out. We had half-baked speculation there was someone after her. A rescue was dispatched. We haven't heard anything since. Even the President doesn't have any current information. What rescue? Powers smiled. Hunter again. Ben, I'm telling you I'm going to have him taken into custody and placed on a plastic hanger in my wardrobe, so I know where the hell he is. He's a lifer, Neela. High speed, low drag. He's into everything, Ben. When did he get the bright idea to launch a rescue mission of the President's daughter? After Baines asked him to, Hafnitz gave Powers a look. Well, I guess that leaves us neatly out of the loop then, doesn't it? Did the President offer him a map and extra supplies too? I realize it seems like Jason Hunter is freelancing, but he's a fine officer, Neela. He doesn't mean any harm. Reminds me a little of me. His sister is busy scoring points with Admiral Tucker's group. I hope you're right, Ben. Young men have a habit of going a few yards over the line. Let's just hope the next time Jason Hunter screws up, he doesn't take half the fleet with him. There's still a plot underway, Neela. We're all in the crosshairs. I've assigned a battalion marine squad to beef up your security. I'll be careful, Ben. You watch out for yourself. It's no mystery who the good guy is around here. Take care, Neela. Powers patted the woman's hand and showed himself out. He stood for a moment outside the door and watched as one of the most decorated admirals alive gently put her reading glasses back on and studied the tablet some more. It was the first time Powers noticed she actually looked like a grandmother. It wasn't hard to imagine all the loving things she could be doing right now for her grandbabies, instead of fighting wars in galactic space. The temptation to despair pulled at Ben Powers' soul. Between them, he and Hafnitz had enough authority to start and end a war on their own. Further, they had the experience and the subordinate officers to pull it off. What was clear after all that had happened was it didn't have to be this way. Skywatch had cut its own throat during the schism, and it did so for one reason, to prove a point nobody had to prove. The willful lack of preparation for the hostilities along Gitern put entire star systems and their populations at risk of invasion or worse. Instead of one recently defeated enemy, now humanity had at least three enemies, and they were out for blood and revenge. And the worst part was a solid case could be made. The humans brought it all upon themselves. Women like Neela Hafnitz were rare beacons of hope. 
but the officers of her generation were also well into their sixties. Admiral Hafnitz's light, like so many others of her class, was beginning to fade. Even with all the excitement and mystique, heroes like Jason Hunter and his sister and other captains like them weren't ready for the weight human civilization was about to place on their shoulders. Powers was firmly against treating men like Jason Hunter as if they were seasoned command officers. The men and women in his class were only a few years out of school. By all rights, he should still be flying jacks and his, his sister should have been pursuing an advanced cybernetics degree, not roaring out into deep space to fight battles that should never have been provoked in the first place. They needed guidance. And they also needed to be reined in. Some would argue frequently. Officers like the Hunter twins were so similar to star athletes. Powers often wondered if he could learn something about leading his corps from baseball managers and hockey coaches. There was an intangible something with Jason Hunter. It was very much like the anticipation everyone experienced when the greatest hitter in the league stepped up to the plate. Something wonderful was about to happen, and the crowd couldn't get excited enough. They couldn't wait to see events take place that they might never see again. Moments like that were memories that lasted a lifetime. Just being there and experiencing the energy of tens of thousands of spectators waiting for a chance to cheer wildly was memorable in itself. Argent's arrival at Bayoni during the victory engagement was a good example. The nearly defeated Skywatch forces didn't expect it. Their enemies certainly didn't expect it. But when the fleet's newest battleship opened up on the Atlantis formation, it was a moment not unlike the crack of the bat and a soaring baseball. When the crowd rose to their feet and their hero watched history sail over the fence, what could you possibly say to that man as his manager? It would be like trying to lecture Achilles himself. You would be presuming upon a conqueror to advise him on proper laces for his boots. There would be no way to sound like anything but a petty hanger-on. Neela was right in one important respect. Heroes like the Hunters sometimes stumbled. Jason did not return from Bayone in glory. In fact, he didn't officially return at all. His sister had to endure an attempt to destroy her career and leave the Hunter legacy in disgrace. His ship ended up crippled and barren. The planet he defended was nearly lost forever. And yet when Jason and Jace received the call, when they heard the Clarion summoning them to duty, they responded the way heroes always did. They faithfully took up their swords and once again stood between evil and the innocent. Powers wondered if that was the price humanity had to pay for genuine heroism. Like all humans, even the most ardent and brave warriors fell short. Often those mistakes led to loss of life and destroyed dreams. But just as often, women and children and elderly that would otherwise be savaged escaped with their lives because one of those brave warriors stopped evil at the gates. If humanity could not tolerate their heroes and their imperfections, how many would fall in their absence? It was up to men like Admiral Benjamin Powers to preserve the balance. Heroes, like anything valuable, had to be cultivated and protected, lest there be nobody at the gates when the call goes up. It was once the duty of Neela Hafnets to stand watch, but her time was coming to an end. Jason and Jace were keen in their ambitions, but it remained to be seen if their idealism would survive. If it did, it would fall to them to relieve the aging lions of Skywatch and carry on. Between the two generations was a self-inflicted wound that was threatening to prove fatal. Benjamin Powers was one of the few men capable of holding everything together until the kids, as the late Commander Enright called them, had the experience and the juice to properly relieve the old guard. He just didn't know if he could hold the line alone. He took a last look at Neela. Shawl or no, she was still Southern Banner's rock. He was going to have to ask her to hold on just a little longer. Advanced Missile Cruiser Saratoga, CL-701. Row Theta-4 Interdiction Zone, Captain Horace Z Commanding. Who's first and how soon? I have 211 eligible targets in track, Captain. Automatic location systems report weapons echeloned and optimized for precision engagement, range closing. Leading edge now six megaclicks. The missile cruiser tactical officer was ensconced in the upgraded version of the three-axis control station, familiar to anyone who had visited the bridge of DSS Constellation. Lieutenant Xavier Leto wore a specially tuned headset that allowed him to rapidly shift overlays across his ship's tactical map. This was vitally important, as it allowed him to monitor the telemetry from the cruiser's immense arsenal of independent warheads. His viewfinders allowed the three-dimensional view of space around his ship to rotate with his orientation. 
Leto could literally see everything within 40 million miles of his ship. He could also examine and target anything within that range as well. His setup was not unlike the automatic targeting systems aboard ancient Earth attack helicopters. Anywhere the pilot looked, his guns followed. The difference here was that anything Leto looked at could be instantly targeted by more than 6,000 warheads, approximately one-third of which contained thermonuclear yields. Saratoga operated on the same basic principles as ships like Constellation, except that her displacement was almost four times greater. As a cruiser-class vessel, she had considerable capacity for the kinds of weapons destroyers simply couldn't transport practically, to say nothing of deploying. This was a key reason she was so vital to Task Force 9's mission in the Rho Theta system. In a head-to-head -head matchup, she wasn't the most effective combatant. Shielded by a task force with a target-rich wave of hostile inbounds at distant ranges, Saratoga was the starship equivalent of the goddess Shiva, and she was about 40 seconds from unleashing her divine wrath. Fire at will, Lieutenant! Leto took the order in stride. His view of space shifted to a top-down tactical map, with options to shift targeting to as many as 11 different overlays. The inbound force of transports and their escort frigates were all within Saratoga's targeting envelope, depending on which weapons were used. Leto was relying on precision targeting from his compression torpedoes. If his analysis of the Sarn defenses were accurate, the resulting hypernovas were going to be decidedly inconvenient for the enemy formations. Alongside the Bullfrog-class torpedoes, Leto had 12 rotary launchers primed with concussion warheads mounted on medium-range missiles. The first barrage was evenly divided among track-on signature, track-on motion, track-on acquisition, and scatter packs. The multi-warhead missiles were all set for track on motion. The whole point of the scatter pack was to let the main missile hull absorb the countermeasures while releasing as many as 40 mini-weapons directly into the enemy vessel's deflection zone. It was the starship combat equivalent of the cluster bomb, and it was devastating to any opponent who didn't see it coming. There was a pause as the commands flashed through the cruiser's systems, and then every bridge in the task force was quieted by a sight few had ever seen. What seemed like hundreds of weapons screamed into space on long blue trails of fire. And then it happened again, and again, and again. A wall of missiles the likes of which almost nobody could even imagine invaded the Sarn formation like hell itself had unleashed fire on the wing. The first target took eleven direct hits before detonating into a red-hot cloud of radiation and interference. The closest six ships all dove out of their approaches. One caught a tumbling piece of plasma trailing debris and snapped in half. A moment later, its engine section silently went up, taking four transports with it. A formation of more than 170 missiles overflew the sudden ocean of fire, followed by a second wave of nearly 300 warheads. Point defense came to life after a few moments of what must have been abject shock among the frigate escort captains. Lances of white plasma rose from the formation to meet the incoming weapons. Some found their targets. The majority missed entirely. As the Sarn data link began to grapple with the magnitude of the problem, a little-known ship that went by the name DSS Circe joined the war. She was essentially the dragonfly spectator to the ultimate war between dinosaurs. But she had one little advantage that most of the other ships didn't. An electronic warfare suite that was connected directly to her fusion plant. Circe's antennas were built like bank vaults, with enough mass to disperse the immense heat and power loads they had to endure. All 31 of the tiny frigate's directionals were pointed at the targets of Saratoga's might. When her captain threw his switch, all hell broke loose. Aboard every Sarn vessel, at least those in the transport formation, point defense, tactical, data link and battle computer readouts went haywire. Suddenly there were no missiles, then there were tens of thousands of missiles. They were flying in all directions. Then they were all flying away from the assault fleet. The only evidence any Imperial captain had their instruments were failing was right beside them each time a warhead impacted one of their fleet mates and caused a deck-rattling explosion. Leto shifted his attention to the inbound starships. His targeting overlay calmly shifted to display eight a moment before Saratoga's wing launchers each fired six hemlock antimatter torpedoes at the formation. Like Constellation's weapons, these missiles were nearly autonomous. They were half again as fast as the sprint missiles in their terminal approach, and they were equipped with their own drive fields and battle screens. They couldn't simply be picked off by an energy battery. They had to be engaged just like an attacking enemy starship. That would have been the Sarn strategy, naturally. There was only one problem. 
Four seconds after twelve antimatter weapons were launched, they vanished into the blackness of space, skillfully concealed by none other than Saratoga's little fleetmate, the electronic warfare frigate called Circe. It was the space combat equivalent of glimpsing twelve world-class assassins and then watching them vanish into thin air moments after drawing their knives and heading your way. With the attack formation now beginning to deteriorate into disarray, Admiral Buford Tucker issued his own firing orders. The first main battery shot from Constitution lit up space for 20 million miles and pegged energy release sensors as far away as the Proximan base. The 60-story bolt of energy howled over the assault force and scarcely missed a Sarn in Vector Cruiser. The lights on the flagship's bridge dimmed again as the second war shot pierced the shadows. Approximately 20 seconds later, it slammed nose first into the Imperial warship Renge, flattening her battle screens and causing her main power systems to overload. Half her deck lights winked out as she fell out of formation. A secondary popped off in her lower decks. Debris began to trail. Two more of Constitution's main battery shots sliced through the Imperial formation. Seconds later, 61 squadrons of Bloodwing fighters overflew the Sarn capital platforms and accelerated towards Admiral Tucker's battle line. Escort Frigate Minstrel, Raleo 2 Deflection Zone. Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Islington commanding. Engineering reports SRS Banks now at 96% functionality. Very well. I want multiple passes on the most recent heat signatures we have readings for. Anything that tops 90% confidence I want to know about it. Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Islington was in no mood for nonsense. The surprise attack on Minstrel and Psy Key almost cost two starship crews their lives. What happened to their attackers in the meantime was a deepening mystery. Neither Islington nor Hunter were known for their tolerance of guessing games. They were answers people, just like Jace's brother. The crew of DSS Minstrel was accustomed to their captain's single-minded pursuit of facts by now. It was one of the things that made the relatively light starship so dangerous. Minstrel even had a reputation among non-human commanders. And now that she was operating as the escort equivalent of a Delaware-class ghost killer, nobody wanted to tangle with her absent an overwhelming tonnage advantage or a well-marked escape route. Let's go over it again, Islington said, turning back to the tactical display on Minstrel's bridge. What clear readings can you give me on the anomaly over Raleo 2? Pilot Finn McCampbell brought up the combat tracking display. We had three unidents in a high-speed parabolic approach to Raleo at 151. It was pretty clear they were going to use the planet's magnetic field to try and throw off our electronic warfare systems. We had a 3x6 lock on the trailing vessel's fusion signature at this interval. Then everything went haywire. Describe haywire. Was it the magnetic field? Negative, ma'am. All three ships registered at exponentially higher mass for a few seconds. Then they reached estimated velocities of four and five times the speed of light before we lost contact. Drive fields? All three vessels had functioning drive fields until 0.7 seconds before loss of contact. Contact Kilo X-Ray 2 dropped her drive field for some reason. Is there any chance they entered Raleo 2's atmosphere? If they did, we didn't get any of the standard readings. There would have been heat signatures, radiation, particle collisions on their velocity fields, magnetic disruptions. There would have been a ton of noise. McCampbell wasn't in any better a mood than his captain. None of what they were seeing made any sense. Islington got up and moved to the helm. She contemplated the tactical display. Recorded on the screen were the final readings from the three-ship formation Minstrel had been tracking before it disappeared. They just winked out, like someone turned off a switch. That's one way to describe it, Finn replied. I suppose they might have engaged cloaks, but that doesn't explain the sudden acceleration or the mass readings. Hunter didn't get anything either, Rebecca said absently. She wasn't tracking the formation before it vanished. And since Psy Ki is on the other side of the planet, they only got a glimpse. The commander tapped her nails on the helm console. What is it about this planet? She muttered. We knew we were in for a freak show, ma'am. This might just be the first act. New contact! I hope you're wrong, pilot, Islington said. Report EWS status. Our cloak is operational in all flight modes. Minstrel is at station keeping. All scanners are set for passive readings only per your orders. Unidentified contact designate Everest 18 bearing 070 Mark 10. Range 200 megaclicks. Slow velocity. High gravimetrics. Possible cruiser class vessel or heavier. If they're Sarn, I hope Raleo eats them too. 
Islington muttered. Finn, veer us off. Get me the hell away from that planet. Cal, narrow beam flash alert to Psy Key. Transmit the position and LRS profile of Unident Everest 18. Notify Commander Hunter Minstrel is in an attack posture and vectoring for open space. Affirmative, Commander. Coding your message. Open a channel to Black Nine. You're on, ma'am. Black Nine, this is Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Islington aboard the Minstrel. Match voice print and identify. Affirmative, Minstrel. Voice print matches. The autonomous gunship's AI was gradually taking on a more and more pleasant personality. I presume you are aware of the Sarn Acheron class war cruiser bearing 072? Islington swiveled to face her signals officer. Yes, we are, Black Nine. How do you know it is an Acheron cruiser? I have compared Everest 18's gravimetric signature to all 1,458 Sarn hull configurations in the Skywatch database. If it is still using the outdated fusion reactor design common to Sarn vessels at the outset of the First Praetorian War, the ship has a fatal flaw at high acceleration in certain flight modes. It is also unable to mask its engine emissions when switching from low to high power utilization in its weapons matrix. The scene on Minstrel's Bridge was very much like a family at Thanksgiving dinner hearing wolves howling in the front yard. Nobody spoke. They just stared at each other, as if they were all experiencing the last six minutes of a Twilight Zone episode together. Islington responded tentatively. Affirmative, Black Nine. Shall I engage the enemy? Negative. I'd like you to go passive and shadow Minstrel's position. Engage your electronic warfare systems and put maximum power into jamming enemy weapons targeting sensors. A fine strategy, Commander. You are making use of a standard positioning pattern for cloaked starships. That is correct, Black Nine. Can you carry out my instructions? Yes, Commander. May I make a suggestion? Go ahead. It would be prudent if I were to maneuver with an anti-neutron drive field envelope. This will make it possible for me to mask my engine signature if I'm forced to make high-energy course adjustments. By all means, Black Nine. Report any unusual contacts or readings to my signals officer. Minstrel out. Escort frigate and gunship settled into formation and turned to intercept the inbound contact. Skywatch Reflector, Deus Undersea Base, Rho Theta 5 Northern Latitudes, Captain Odessa Lin Commanding. One of the key strategic advantages to a facility like the Reflector Base was its relative inconvenience to attacking forces. It had a natural shield that even advanced technology would require time to penetrate. It was three miles deep in a frozen ocean, and it had some of the most formidable anti-orbital defenses in the fleet. It was the subterranean equivalent to facilities like the space station orbiting RT-3. Rho Theta-5 was a considerable distance from the bulk of the fighting, at least at the moment. That much was made clear on Captain Lin's tactical displays. To a less experienced strategic thinker, that might invite thoughts of dismissing Reflector as too far away to contribute. Unfortunately for Skywatch, the Imperial High Command knew better. Reflector Deus Base was the facility tasked with control of the system's satellite network, while other facilities like the ground installations on Rho Theta-4 and the orbital station at RT-3 could tie into the orbital platforms circling all three planets, it was Reflector that maintained the network's central data link. The reasons for this were twofold. One, Captain Lin's base was virtually impervious to attack. Second, the underwater facility had immense geothermal power reserves, which could be used to pierce almost any kind of battlefield electronics. It was overbuilt for one obvious reason, and that was the Rho Theta primary. The powerful solar wind thrown into space by the system's star made simple radio communications almost impossible. The position of the Proximan listening station at the edge of the system was chosen for that very reason. Skywatch had other plans, but their engineers told the Admiralty that if they placed stations and surface facilities in system, they were going to have to account for the fact they would be competing with a gigantic interference machine for about the next two billion years. What the Skywatch base did was pit the gargantuan energy of Rho Theta 5's molten core against the eternal power of the system's intense star. Up to now, due to human ingenuity and more than a little luck, the base was winning and that gave the fleet its opportunity to build a massive network of precision satellites. Those birds were almost certain to cause the Sarn task force all kinds of trouble, which was why a non-trivial squadron of assault craft were bearing down on the RT-5 deflection zone. What have you got? Inbound hostile contacts, ma'am. Nine vessels in track. Orbital Ring 4 has the range and a waveform lock on the lead spacecraft. Open space interference factor is now 34.7 subeats and rising steadily.
Odessa Lynn stood near the tactical console in an immense battle control center on her station's third main deck. The view above was an icy ocean filled with all manner of alien life. The underwater lights extending up the side of the towering cliff that formed most of the foundation for the base blazed in various hues from emerald green to frozen blue, filling the swirling water with sparkling beauty. The pressure on the domed viewport at the apex of the control center was 16 Terran tons per square inch. The specially designed transparent carbon lattice barrier was 91 inches thick at its crown and more than 260 feet in diameter. Activate automatic orbital defenses. Arm all medium-range warheads and stand by for a firing solution. Aye, ma'am. Ring 4 now reports all weapons charged and standing by. More than 200 miles above the planet's surface, a fast-moving fleet of automated satellites unfolded like nightmarish swamp plants, revealing bank after bank of powerful sprint missiles, anti-ship warheads, and electronic warfare pods. The EW weapons were one of the best-kept secrets of Rho Theta's defense deployment. They were essentially interference transmitters loaded on the same missile frames as their medium-range attack warheads. Nearly impossible to target, much less destroy, the EW pods went in with their more destructive cousins and simply broke up on impact, having done their duty. Combined with the almost unimaginable noise already present in the system, Captain Lin's secret weapons were what one strategic expert back at HQ called patently unfair. Time to optimum range. 28 seconds, ma'am. One of the most important principles of deep space combat was the effective deployment of weapons by type. The best example was the fundamental difference between energy weapons and missiles. First-year cadets at Skywatch Academy learned to solve the weapon choice problem on the day they learned not to rely on their clever recognition that space is three-dimensional and that they can simply fly around, over, or under any defenses that can be perceived as two-dimensional on their tactical displays. When professors and instructors saw that kind of thinking, they reminded their too-clever-by-half students that space is not three-dimensional but four-dimensional, and that anything that can be flown around can also lock targets at any point on a sphere with a diameter equal to their range from the target. The weapon choice problem was easy, provided the Skywatch forces weren't relying on the wrong kind of weapon for the job. Missiles can fly around corners. Energy weapons have to travel in a straight line. Those were the considerations from the standpoint of the physics involved. Choosing the wrong weapon for the task at hand was the kind of tactical blunder that could easily lead to defeat. Captain Lin was one of the instructors at Skywatch Academy, who taught officer candidates and weapon specialists the strategic difference between missiles and energy weapons. That was why she knew her base was in a much tougher situation now than originally believed. The SRS contacts on the deflection zone scope were unmistakable. How many? I'm tracking 71 inbound strike fighters. They are using beam target acquisition, and they are vectoring to engage orbital ring 4. The captain knew she didn't have much time. Emergency activation, orbital 3. Energy emplacements only. Engage defensive standoff patterns and prepare to open fire on my order. 20 to 30 miles inside the outermost satellite defenses, another array of shiny black hulls pivoted in space bringing battery after battery of powerful plasma cannon to bear on the fast-moving wall of Imperial Bloodwing fighters. Captain Lin knew it wasn't enough. All she could hope for was to leave the bastards bleeding and crippled. After that, all she could hope for was their withdrawal. That was the only way for the fleet to maintain the satellite network. Without it, Rho Theta would be lost. Condor flagship Shrike, Epsilon Gamma 3, Exosphere. Captain Cerulea Lorleans, commanding under normal circumstances, Jason Hunter would have been highly concerned about how far off the reservation Cerulea had gone with the design of the Shrike. She had essentially built a fast, highly efficient privateer frigate around the most feared weapon in known space. M-guns were banned by treaty and had been for nearly 90 years. When fired, they had a habit of doing far more than just destroying their targets. The unstable release of M-rays caused unceasing mayhem, including ionization of atmospheres, the creation of autonomous magnetic storms, and the total disruption of biological equilibrium. M-rays caused most life forms to lose their balance, hallucinate, experience uncontrolled muscle spasms, and hyperventilate. In short, they were the perfect weapon for someone unwilling to follow rules. Outlawing the devices only invited outlaws to treasure them, and Captain Lorleon was no exception. She was a true fan. 
Her highly illegal finances had advanced the technology by leaps and bounds during her career. As a result, the Shrike was a dreaded ship, very similar to vessels commanded by Caribbean marauders like Bartholomew Roberts and Calico Jack. Its primary weapon could quite literally open the door to the deepest of man's fears. At the moment, however, the captain of the Argent was less interested in unleashing devastation and more interested in remaining undetected. Shrike was approaching the coordinates provided by the Hansons and confirmed by other residents of the village not far from General Hunter's compound. The region was ostensibly the site of the village's water treatment plant and was situated on the side of a 2,000-foot rocky formation of either large hills or small mountains, depending on who you asked. The geographic features were the thing that drew Hunter's attention. They looked familiar to him, and he couldn't quite put his finger on why. Are we detectable? Of course not, Cerelia replied, glancing at Hunter with an, Are you serious? Look, this thing can hold a cloak at ranges of a hundred yards, unless they've got a scanner bank down there straight out of your own weapons labs and a team of people who know how to use it, there's no chance anyone knows we're here. Hunter turned his attention to the sensor suite. There was something about that mountain range that was just odd. Let's hold altitude at 150 miles. I still don't know what you're looking for. There's nothing down there but trees and deer. The captain put his knowledge of the sensor data from Hallow's Moon to work. He configured Cerulea's sensor banks to scan for the same decaying particles Colonel Moody and Sergeant Alexander found. Sure enough, as he adjusted the instruments, a purple-white field of previously undetected energy began to register. Oh no. That didn't sound ominous. Not at all, Cerulea replied. There's an Ithis hive down there. What did General Hunter put in your eggs this morning? I saw him sprinkling something over that skillet. I'm serious, Captain. It's got to be under that mountain somewhere. This is what the Sarn are trying to hide. We're more than 100 light years from Bione. Why would there be an Ithis hive all the way out here? There's nobody on this planet, Jason. They're villagers with perhaps 10,000 acres planted. Even if you count the ducks, there aren't enough people here to fill a church. Maybe that was the whole idea. Put the thing somewhere nobody would look. You mean the Sarn don't know about your grandfather? Nobody knows about him. He spent the last 15 years making doubly and triply sure he was as far off the grid as it is possible to get. Cerulea banked the Shrike around so the look-down optical pickups could target the opposite side of the low mountain range. Then they don't know what he's got underground either. That may turn out to make the difference, Captain. We've got to go down there and put this facility out of commission. Well, at least you're starting to sound like Jason Hunter again, but I do need to remind you there are two of us. And possibly hundreds or thousands of them. Jason leaned back in the co-pilot's shock couch and grinned. Then it will be a fair fight. You're not paying me enough for this. We haven't added up your overtime yet. Honey, there hasn't yet been a calculator invented. Hunter switched the heads-up display to superimpose the readings he had detected over the topographical map of the range. There's a complex down there that looks an awful lot like Lethe Deeps. If they've gone as far down as the defense base, there's no telling what they might be doing. Even forces that knew what they were up against would have trouble with the pressure. All this from one guy? Cerulea asked. I know whoever you're chasing is supposed to be a handful, but he sure as hell didn't dig miles deep under a mountain range by himself. We don't know how that underground complex at the deeps was made. I asked my best techs on Argent and they couldn't explain it either. At some point that far down mechanisms will seize up, even if they are prepared for the heat and pressure. I don't know what you think you're going to find. We'll know when we see it, Captain. Start looking for a landing site. We're going in. <laughs>